Go live start. Hello everyone. Welcome. Welcome again to our 18th in the series of, well, it started off as 20, now it's 19, in our series of 19 videos, demonstrations, conversations, and sale of Native American pottery. We're here in Santa Fe at Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery, and I'm Andrea Fisher. And I want to say welcome, and I'm glad that you are tuning in. We are delighted to make these presentations and have been having lots of fun doing them over the last month. Uh, today we have Carlos Latte from Zuni Pueblo, and he is going to be uh, demonstrating and all of his beautiful pottery. And you know, the reason that we decided to do this is because Indian Market this year was canceled. And for those of you who are not familiar with Indian Market, it is the largest Native American sale or marketplace in the country. Next year will be its 100th birthday. Long time, long time. And it attracts about 100,000 people to Santa Fe, a town of 60,000 people. And it's an extraordinary weekend weekend of all sorts of activities. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, it was canceled this year along with just about every other vehicle or venue that Native Americans have to sell their artwork. And so we decided that what we would do was try and do some in-depth demonstrations and film all of them with the potters because while Indian Market is a nice place to meet the potters, with 100,000 people roaming the streets, there's never really time for an in-depth conversation. And we've made these um, demonstrations really, really long because we want to give you the idea of how long and how involved uh, it is to make a piece of Native American pottery. Uh, we are, you know, just delighted to bring you this, this whole phase because I think it will be a greater understanding of what Native American pottery is all about. And uh, we uh, are, you know, we're coming, we're drawing to an end of this particular series. But it's not the, the final end, it's just the end of this group. We've had so many people tell us that they would like us to continue on. And so many potters who have called us and said, oh, it looks like fun, can I do one too? And so after we recover from um, this series and do a little bit of editing, uh, then we will uh, bring you another group of potters so that you can get an understanding of what's going on. The, the emphasis on the other potters will be Navajo and Hopi. And there are no Navajo and Hopi potters included in this series because the pandemic has struck both of those reservations very, very hard. And as a result, we didn't know whether people would be able to leave their, their homes to come here and film with us. So when this is passed, we will make sure that you have lots and lots of information about Navajo and Hopi potters as well. If you want to look at the schedule or see um, what the the you know with the films that we've done before, it's really very very easy. You just go to YouTube and search for Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery, and the other sixteen that we've seventeen that we've done will be up there for your enjoyment and for you to look at at, at your leisure. Um, that Then tomorrow, uh, I just want to speak a little bit about tomorrow, the last one. We are going to have Marilyn Ray, and Marilyn makes these incredible storytellers, and we will all have lots of fun watching her. Um, form 
and uh, sand and polish and, and paint her storytellers tomorrow. And Marilyn is sort of the master storyteller maker that's alive today. And so we're really looking forward to, to seeing her. And uh, she will be here from 11 until 3 o'clock and uh, mountain time. And uh, we will do our best to give you an idea of all the time and effort and work it takes to make one of those storytellers. Well, today we have Carlos Laate from... Oh, and by the way, if you go to uh, look at the, the videos, uh, would you please uh, subscribe to us on YouTube? And also, if you like what you saw, would you pass this, some information on to your friends? And maybe they would like to learn something about Native American pottery as well. And you will notice there's, a lo there's some repetition in each one of the uh, videos, only because we want each one of them to be able to stand alone so that if someone is doing a lot of painting on their pottery in one video, that you don't have to go to another video to find out where the clay came from or how they formed the pot. Each one we're trying to do is, is self-contained. Now, Carlos today has brought us some of his really very traditional Zuni work, and uh, we're delighted to have him. And, of course, the main reason that we're doing this is because all of those venues for the artists have been canceled this year. And I, I know that some of them, uh, the, the, the money that they earn uh, for the uh, work that they do, uh, a great portion of it comes from their sales at Indian Market. And for some people, it's their only income. And they're, since they're all self-employed, there are no government benefits, um, no checks to receive in the mail. Um, they're sort of on their own. Yesterday, um, Diane Lewis was telling us how dependent her family was on the food bank. And it's hard to imagine in this day and age that uh, there are people that are living in America that don't have food in their refrigerator to eat. I mean, it's just shocking. And so we decided that this would be a way for them to earn money. And so anything that you purchase that directly benefits the artists that we have here today. And also, all the artists that we've had in the past, we have, uh, that we carry their work and they are, it's available on our website. Now, if you want to see what um, Carlos has up close, I mean, the cameras will show you some, but uh, the website is really the best place to look because you can have details. It will give you a description, it will give you a size, it will give you the price, and it will give you a code number. And if you wish to purchase any of those pieces, you can contact us, and there's information on the website, or you can send us an email, or you can just phone us up. We have, um, as they say on the shopping network, operators are standing by. And we have Erica, Denise, and Amy today that are here to help you. Now, the way you get to Carlos's pieces is that um, you go to our website, you click on artists, then you click on the L words, and Carlos is the first one because uh, his name is spelled L-A-A-T-E. And the first one that comes up will be the most expensive one. And as you scroll down, uh, the prices decrease until you get to the least expensive one. And so uh, you should remember that anything that you purchase today or, you know, any time from us uh, later on will directly benefit the artist. So, I think I've said just about everything that I need to say. And, oh, one other thing. If you have any questions for Carlos, please don't hesitate to um, look at the chat, you know, hit the chat button, and send us a question, because uh, we would be more than happy to, I'll be more than happy to direct them to, to Carlos, and um, that way you can get some personal information. So...
Without further ado, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Carlos Laate from Zuni Pueblo. And if you want to say hello, Carlos, you certainly may. <laughs> hello. <laughs> <laughs> Name's Carlos Laate. I'm from uh, Zuni Pueblo. And how long have you been making pots, Carlos? I've been doing uh, clay work around like 20, 24 years. 24 years, lots of experience. And, and what are you going to do for us today? Uh, I'm going to start by uh, uh, doing a pinch pot. Oh, a pinch pot. Okay, well then if you want to get your um, materials out, uh, okay. that would be just great. And we'll go from there. Now, this clay that you brought, um, I always ask, did you go to the clay store and buy it? No, this, this is a traditional clay that I get myself. And where'd you get it from? I get it from the reservation. Uh, it, it's about like uh, five miles south of Zuni. Uh, it's called a Pai Mesa that I get my clay from. Yeah, well, for people who don't know where Zuni is located, um, if you go west from Albuquerque on I-40, uh, how, how far, how many miles from Albuquerque is Zuni? I would say it's 150 so miles. So 150 miles due west. How close is Zuni to the Arizona border? 10 miles. 10 miles. Oh, so you're almost in Arizona. Yes. Almost in cactus country. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And um, Zuni's right along I-40. And so uh, unlike Acoma, where you have to go 20 miles south again to get, the old, get to the old village, the um, Zuni Pueblo is pretty close t to the highway. And um, have you lived in Zuni? Were you born in Zuni? Yes. Did, yes. Have you lived there all your life? All my life I've been uh, living in Zuni. And so um, you go and you get the clay at Zuni uh, on the mesa that you're talking about. How, how far away from the village is the, the place where the clay is? It's probably around five to seven miles. There's two ways that you can get up there, but the first one is already ha already has like a... Um, Erosion, that that road that uh, we used to go up, and so you the, have the roads washed out. Yes. Uh huh. So if you want to go up um, that way, you have to walk. No, you you just drive up there. You drive up there. Yeah. There's oh. two ways that you can go up. Uh, the other one is probably around uh, like ten to fifteen miles going around. Oh, so, so you have to go way. around the the mesa. To on the other road. Yeah, it's on top of uh -huh. the mesa that we get our clay. Uh huh. Now, when you go and get clay, um, how much do you get it? The the, you know, when you uh, when you dig it up there. I usually get like around. I would say, ten buckets. Like, like five, five gallon buckets. Yeah, the five gallon uh -huh. buckets I use. So. Um, when I go up and uh, I harvest my clay, I just don't uh, go up there and uh, start digging or anything like that. Uh, I take cornmeal and some food offerings. Uh, so this is uh, Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of Mother Earth. It's, it's her skin that we use in making... Uh, her skin? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, this, this is how it looks. And... Uh, I do a little bit of praying to Mother Earth and uh, offer her some cornmeal and then feed her uh, some food. And then after that, I'll start looking around to the place where I'm going to be digging the clay out. Mm -hmm. So usually I just kind of like take a, like a, a knife and then once I've uh, dig out, cleaned the uh, place where I'm going to get the clay, 
I just use a small knife just to take a little piece out. Uh, I don't use any like hammers or chisels or anything like that. Once you get the clay out, it's almost like a puzzle. You take that small piece out and everything just comes apart. You uh -huh. just get it from, uh, you know, so from it that crumbles. small piece. Yeah. Um, do you happen to have a piece of raw clay with you today? See what yes, it looks I like? Have, yes, I have. Oh, um, can we take a look? This is the raw material. It's, it's, oh, can, it's you, almost, can you tap it harder on the, on the board? Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, like a, a it's a rock. Uh -huh. It's like a rock. Yeah. And this is how it looks. It's, it's underneath a big boulders. And once, once a piece comes out, everything comes up, up uh -huh. falling apart. D does the boulder come with it? No, no. Oh, it, good. We, we kind of like go under, you know, try and get the pieces out. Uh -huh. So that's how I uh, get my uh, clay. So you have all these buckets full of these rocks. Yes. And then, and you take them home, then what happens? I take them home and um, I'll just go ahead and uh, bag the clay, uh, the flower bags that I use. It usually comes out like 10, 12 uh, uh, flower bags mm -hmm. and I just storm outside. In, those, in, in this rock, when it's in this form, in, in rocks, it's yes. bags of rocks. The bags of rocks that I store, uh -huh. and then once I uh, soak the clay, it'll just dissolve right away. I don't use tap water. I use uh, spring water for my uh, soaking of the clay. Uh -huh. And well, if you if you use tap water, it's it smells. You know, it, it, tap water has chlorine in it, but spring water. Oh, so or, you have you have pipes. In, in Zuni where you can get the water out of the faucet and and is it like well water or city water or no it's it's spring water it's spring water I travel like about 16 18 miles uh, out of Zuni to another uh, village called Pescado that's where we get our uh, spring water fish Pescado means Pe fish doesn't it I'm not sure how yeah what I it think means, so but, uh, there's, there's a, a water well over there. Uh -huh. That's where I get my water to soak the clay. And, um, so it smells bad if you uh, use tap water? Yes. But it, it's, it smells like clay, like clay should mm -hmm. smell uh, if you use the spring water. It, yeah, it has that earthy smell. Uh -huh. uh, it doesn't smell that uh, bad. So when you, when you soak the clay, what do you soak it in? I mean, is it... I soak it in... Uh, Five gallon buckets. Uh huh. And I uh, leave it for about like a day or two uh -huh. to dissolve. And so it gets real soft and watery and. Yes, um, there's not that much of you know rocks in it. Uh huh. Uh, when when you uh, screen it, all you have to screen it is uh, for roots. And pebbles. So when you dig the clay, you have to get it out from under the boulders because if it was out in the open when it rained, the clay would dissolve like it does, you know, when you soak it. And, yeah. the, and the boulders sort of protect the clay from being rained on. Yes. Uh, and it sounds pretty dangerous to me. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> the one that's, you know... Uh, you can see from outside the boulders, it's, you know, it's just like sand. Uh-huh. But still, it's clay. You know, you, you can uh, sift it or you can just uh, soak it and then screen it. So you put a lot of water in with the, the, the rocks in your five-gallon buckets? Yes. Uh, well, actually, just have half of uh, the bucket and then you can just pour or put the clay inside the bucket so that way you know it'll mm -hmm. just soak right away and when it dissolves what happens to the roots and the seeds and all it, that other stuff? it floats to the top it floats to the top and then you can get just kind of like uh have a 
a screen with you and just get the uh, floating roots. So you strain it. Yeah, you strain like it spaghetti. first. Yeah, you 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 just kind of like strain it first, and then after you strain it, you gotta mix it, mix the clay, and then. Um, well, do you keep you, pouring the water off once it's dissolved? Until no, you, no, you no. just kind of leave it in the bucket. Leave it in the bucket, and then the water evaporates. The extra water evaporates. You evap some of it evaporates, but you just kind of like leave it there for a while and let the clay it just kind of uh, go down. Uh. Mm -hmm. So what, what, tell me about what you're doing there. And we'll talk more about clay and soaking and rocks and weeds and seeds. Okay, I'm, I'm doing a pinch pot. I'm not using any tools, so I'm, I'm just using you know, my uh, hands to form a small pinch pot. Now, what do you do to take care of your hands? I mean, clay is really drying. It's uh, I don't. I don't really use the clay is uh, moist. Yeah. And wet. You can. But doesn't yeah. it draw the water out of your hands and make your hands all dry? And not really. For no. me, it's okay. Lucky you. <laughs> Lucky you, because I know a couple potters that say that their hands are all cracked and dried and calloused and. Uh, and they have a really hard time, you know, keeping their hands um, dry so that they don't crack and bleed. Uh, yeah, I don't really use any water when I'm uh, working on clay. Maybe just on when I'm uh, done with uh, my piece uh -huh. that I'm working on. So you don't uh. have to put lots of lotion on, or no, or. or Salad oil or lard no. or, or any of those other kinds of things on your hands. No, no, I, I don't use any of that. Yeah. It's just but it's the feel of the clay, the consistency of the clay that you uh, uh, work with. Well, you must know Anderson Panetta. Yes. Yeah, uh, ask him about his hands sometime. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been talking to him too, so yeah. I know a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he has, uh, well, he's been working with clay um, longer than me. So I've been, uh, well actually I, after, right after high, high school, I joined the service. I was in the service for, for a while and then uh, went back out. Uh, I went back to school for uh, welding. And then after welding uh, school, I went back home uh, there was uh, no jobs around the reservation for a welder, and I didn't. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. weld the rocks in the dirt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I tried everything. I tried jewelry. I tried uh, fetish carving, mm -hmm. and then once I got to the clay, you just yeah. you know stuck with, yeah. stuck to you know the clay. The clay spoke to you, and mm. you talked back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. But. Um, did you, um, well, who taught you how to make pots? My uh, grandmother. Uh-huh. Uh, she was a potter. Yeah, and what, uh, and her name? Uh, Daisy Hui. Daisy Hui is yeah. really famous, but Daisy makes pots in the Hopi style. Yeah, she, she did, and uh -huh. uh, she, she married into a Zuni uh, Pueblo. She, oh, she married into Zuni from Hopi. Yes. Uh huh. And she was um, Nampeo of Hano's granddaughter. Yeah, famous uh -huh. potters. Famous, oh, really famous, famous. Oh, you learned from the best, honey. Yes, <laughs> I did. I used to go out uh, to her uh, house and... I used to ob observe her doing her work. Uh huh. And this was at Zuni. Yes. Mm hmm. And that's where I kind of like got to see her do the clay work. Uh huh. Now she worked in the the Hopi style for a while, and then in the Zuni style, or ever in the Zuni style. Um. I heard that she was doing jewelry too. Oh, yeah? She, yeah, she was uh, a silversmith. And huh. then... That's unusual. Women of that era 
uh, usually didn't make jewelry. They made, they made uh, pots, and the men carved the fetishes, and the men carved the, the kachinas, and, uh, uh, but, uh, and the men made the jewelry, and it was unusual to have a woman make jewelry. Yes. Um, uh, my family uh, uh, was doing jewelry. My mother, uh, she, she was a, a creative person. Yeah. And my father, uh, she was, he was all a uh, uh, jack of all trades. Yeah. So I learned from both of them. From both of them. Now yeah. your, and your parents' names? Uh, my father's name is Laikati uh, uh, Lati. And then my mother's name is uh, Ethelene Lati. Mm -hmm. So they taught you, and and you were how old? Um, I learned jewelry when I was probably like fifteen years old. Oh, oh, uh -huh. so um, so you didn't start when you were like three or four. No, no, no. no. But at an early age, uh, my uh, father was a farmer, uh -huh. so we used to, you know. Actually, you know, when we were kids, they got us up early in the morning to help out in the fields. So yeah, well, it's better to do it early in the morning. Otherwise, if you do it in the, um, the afternoon, you fry out in the New Mexico hot sun. Yes, <laughs> it was really hot. It gets hot. Um, And what what did your what did your papa grow? Uh, different kind of uh, plants: uh, corn, squash, chili beans, pumpkins, all sorts of uh, vegetables too. So, uh, I think I'm uh, taking his food stamps. You yeah, know, do you go? You, are you a farmer at heart? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so am I. Right now we have a garden. Yeah. Uh, over at Nutria area. Uh huh. So we go out to attend that garden. And well, we, how big is the Zuni reservation? You know, it's it's not so big, but you know, we have a lot of people. Uh, it's about like ten thousand. 10,000 yeah. people? And Something how, like that. How many potters are there? Well, it kind of died out, but it kind of uh, got back to like about, I don't know, 15, 20 people. 15, 20 it's, out of thousands. Yes. Oh, that's too bad. Well, uh, are you taking any responsibility for teaching someone, like a, a child or a grandchild? I think we don't have any uh, uh, children. You don't have any children. Oh, well, mm -hmm. that makes it a lot harder to teach your grandchildren then, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> I did um, teach my uh, uh, nieces uh -huh. and uh, nephews. Yeah. But they're interested in other things. Well, how old are they? They're like about in their 20s. In their right 20s. Now. Well, you know, it's really bizarre because I've seen this happen over and over again um, with, uh, with all the Pueblos, is that uh, kids are small, you know, like up to 10 years old, and they sat with grandma and, or mom and dad, and, and they learned how to make pots, and they really like making pots, and then as soon as they became teenagers, it just ended completely. And then in their late 20s, early 30s, that's when they decided to take it up as a profession. And uh, the, the spark was rekindled at that time period. So maybe there's some hope for your nieces and nephews uh, when they get a little older to realize what a, um, a great privilege it is to have all that talent and, uh, and then to go ahead and use it. So uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, you started when you were in your 20s or 30s to make uh, pots? 20s. 20s? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
Wow. After, you know, uh, trying to look for a job, there's hardly any jobs around there at that, that time. And I couldn't, you know, go out of the re reservation. Didn't have no vehicle. The only thing that I, I would do is, you know, do odd jobs uh -huh. uh, to support myself. And I did work out of my um, uh, garage to do some uh, welding and uh, well for other people's, uh, you know, like broken things, uh, shovels, bicycles, uh, car fenders, different kind of uh, metal work that I did. And then uh, I did, you know, uh, go out for uh, firefighting too. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that's certainly a needed profession, profession in the West uh, these days. I don't know if you know we have a fire here in Santa Fe, the Rio and Medio fire, which is about, oh, I don't know, five, six miles north of Santa Fe, and it's been burning for a week now. And oh, driving in today, it wasn't nearly as smoky as it has been, and it seems like it's under control a little more. What They're getting around it. They're getting around it. Oh, hallelujah. Because it's, it was moving towards Santa Fe, which would be a, a disaster, and towards the Santa Fe ski area. But what was really cool with this, what the ski area did uh, a couple days ago when there was the possibility that the fire was going to be coming that way is they pulled out all of their snowmaking equipment and hooked it all up. And if the snow, of the snow, if the fire moved in that direction, they were going to just start making snow like mad, oh. uh, snowing in August in the mountains, <laughs> uh, and that would be a good way to protect the ski area. But we have a whole bunch of questions here, and uh, one of them came from Doug, and it, he wants to know what sort of food uh, do you give Mother Earth as an offering? Just cornmeal, or is it some other sort, or is it something else? Well, every, every time when we have dinner, you take a little piece of whatever you're eating. You just take a piece off, uh, put it aside, and then you can uh, feed that to uh, Mother Earth. And um, usually when, when we go out harvesting our clay, there's uh, paper bread. There's what? Um, paper bread. Um, like, like peaky uh, bread? Peaky bread, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, peaky bread is like paper. Kind yeah. Kind of tastes uh, like paper, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we offer her that. Uh-huh. And... Uh, so you say that... Well, so before you, like, have a meal at home, you take a little sampling from your plate and you put it... You have a special bowl on the table? Yes, we have that, an offering bowl that uh -huh. uh, we use. I make and uh, we put... And you the put those samples pieces, of food yeah. in. Now, do yeah. you save that offering bowl for when you go to, uh, out to uh, dig clay? Yes. And you mm -hmm. take that from Mother Earth? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. that's what we feed the Mother Earth. And, uh, so Mother Earth might have um, green chili stew or macaroni and cheese? Yes. Or... Um, <laughs> A peanut yes. butter and jelly sandwich? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Anything that we uh, eat, you know, uh, to offer uh, with the ancestors. Uh-huh. And uh, we ask for blessings. And uh -huh. then we ask for, for part of her uh, skin to yeah. make pottery. Uh-huh. So you share uh, what you have to eat with, and give it back to her because that's where it all came from in the first place. From her. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I well, I, Doug. I hope that answers your question. And uh, we have another uh, question comment and uh, from Dan Marr, who is in San Diego. And by the way, Dan, it is a, uh, a crested echeveria, and it's really special, isn't it? Yes. Uh, he's my cactus. He's my cactus friend on on uh, line, uh, and we met because of these talks. And he's he was the head of the whole 
um, cactus and succulent society of America and probably knows more about cactuses and succulents than all the people in New Mexico combined. And so every day I bring one from my collection just, you know, just to have a little fun. Uh -huh. And, uh, but anyway, he sent this, uh, questions, comments. And it says, Dan Marr here. It is good to see you, though unfortunately not in person. He's talking to you. Okay. I just wanted to say hello and thank you for the custom pieces you've made for us. They are much cherished pieces in our collection. I, ex I especially thank you for taking on a new challenge with the most recent piece. And do you know who Dan Marr is? Yes. Yeah, oh, hello, good. Dan. <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go, there we go. Also, I'm delighted to, to see your new turtles with dragonflies. Please give my regards to Roxanne, and I much appreciate all the information she sends to me. She's a very good correspondent. I wish you the very best. Please stay safe and healthy, and I look forward to my next visit to Zuni. And thanks to Andrea and Derek and all the staff for this fantastic idea. So, Dan, thank you from all of us. Roxanne yeah. is here. She's sitting off off camera, and uh, I'm sure says hello oh. to, yeah, there we go, <laughs> to Dan. But uh, that was really good. But yes, a crested echeveria. And I think there's one more in here. Oh, uh, one more question. Doug wanted to know, um, who did you learn from? Uh, from my grandmother, Daisy Hui. Daisy. That's, that's, uh, where I get the you know inspiration uh, from her doing her clay work. Well, isn't Daisy Huey credited with being the person to really revive Zuni pottery? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, she made a dance group too, um, and she uh, kind of like uh, gathered the Zuni women uh, to her home, and uh, they had some conversations while they're while she was doing uh, uh, the clay work with them. And they did uh, form a, a dance group too. Mm -hmm. And are those the ladies that are always photographed in their traditional head, um, when their traditional clothing with a, a pot on their heads? Yes. Uh-huh. And, and so uh, J uh, Daisy was the one who uh, really got that group started and, and when, when did she pass away? Do you re remember? Somewhere in the late 70s that uh -huh. she passed. Yeah. She must have been quite an elderly lady at that point. Yes. Um, she uh, did, did some singing too, uh -huh. uh, to perform in a parade, uh, the Indian ceremonial uh, in Yawa. Oh, uh-huh. Well, I Indian ceremonial's been going on a long time. I don't know if it's, I'm not so sure it's longer than um, the Indian market here, but uh, it's really, you know, absolutely incredible. It's a, a visual um, explosion of, of music and culture. Uh, really, really very, very interesting. and. Then, of course, you know, there's a huge art exhibit as well, and lots of prizes, and uh, uh, really, really an interesting thing to attend. And so, Daisy, da did you ever live with Daisy, or did you? No, we, no? we, we kind of like just go visit, visit, visiting her over at her home uh, and my uh, grandfather. He was a, a jeweler, too, uh -huh. so I used to go over there and help them out, too. Wow. Now, did he do any of the, um, the petty point no, jewelry? No. Uh, he was doing uh, cluster uh, jewelry. Uh-huh. Uh, he, he used to make uh, bowl of ties, uh, watch bracelets, and uh, different kind of uh, jewelry work that, mm -hmm. that he was doing. Well, the Zunis are really very famous for their 
very tiny, tiny turquoise stones that are set in still silver in incredible patterns and uh, really, really beautiful, beautiful work. Are there many jewelers left at SUNY? There's a whole bunch of jewelers. Whole bunch of jewelers. Yeah, yeah but, <laughs> but only a few, only a few potters. Yes, uh, but right now I think it's kind of uh, going up. You know, yeah. A lot of people uh, starting to do their uh, pottery work. So there's another revival. Mm -hmm. Tell me, tell me more about what you're what you're doing with the pot. I'm just uh, using my hands just to form a pinch pot. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't use any uh, tools to, you know, slap the clay. <laughs> <laughs> I just use my fingers. It's, just so, to... it's so round and perfect and even. How did that happen? Practice? It's, it's practice. Practice. Uh, wow. For a long time, yeah. Now, when you make a bigger pot, I would assume you don't make you don't pinch those big pots, do you? No, I don't. I uh, use coil, and then I just use my hands to uh, to uh, strengthen the, the walls of uh -huh. the pot. So it's almost there. Oh gosh! Look at that sweet out. little thing. Now, after you dig the clay and you soak the clay, do you um, let it age for a while, or, or can you use it right away after you know the it's the right consistency? Yeah, um, you get the clay to to where you want to uh, work with, have, get the right consistency of the clay, and uh, that's where you you kind of like uh, shape and uh, form the pots that mm -hmm. they are making. Now, Carlos, with your pieces that we see on display here, uh, they're, they're three different colors. They're sort of a, a, a goldy, goldy color and a red color and a white color. Um, is it all the same clay? It's, it, yes, it's all the same clay. And um, there's only three colors. There's white, red, and then the natural color. Uh, the paint is kind of like a brownish color, but once you burn it, it's going to come out black. Uh-huh. Yeah, but the, the clay, the, the background color, um, that sort of natural color of the clay, which is kind of um, sort of fleshy colored, peachy yeah. colored. Yeah, yeah, is that, if you fired that piece just the way it is now, would it come out that color? Right now it's kind of like a grayish color, but once you fire it, well, once it's all dried out, you uh, sand it down, uh, smooth it out with water, and then you fire it, it comes out a peachy color. That PG color, uh huh. But the, but the red. Then, then how do you get the red and how do you get the white? This is the red color. You, you just kind of like soak it in water. That's the red color. It this doesn't look very red, red to me. <laughs> and this is the white color. It's all natural material that I use. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no commercial clays. And this right here is the paint. Mm -hmm. This is how it looks. It's, it's brownish so color. So you didn't know that uh, when you were growing up you were going to be a geologist uh, when you have to know what all those rocks mean and what they do and, and how, how, what colors they turn when you fire them and that you can actually use them as part of your uh, pottery making. Uh, who, taught, who taught you how to gather the, the various uh, uh, colors that you were going to use on your pots? My father, yeah. he, he was a, a four service aide. Oh. So uh -huh. he knew the area around uh, the Zuni Mountain uh -huh. uh, 
He used to work around the McAfee area. So he knew where to get all these material. And he took me over there where this and that kind of material was. And he showed me the places. So I go out different places just to gather up my uh, material. Now, was that before you abandoned welding and jewelry making and, and fetish carving, or was it after? Uh, when you started, you know, making pottery seriously? It was after. It was after. Yeah. Uh-huh. And how did he know where to get these things and what, how, what they were going to produce? Well, I guess, you know, uh, their parents, you know, uh -huh. knew where to go. Daisy. And Daisy and uh, the, my father's parents. Oh, okay. Uh, were, were, were oh, so Daisy is your mother's mother? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to get the family genealogy all straightened out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Daisy was a lady that knew where to get the clay. So uh -huh. uh, she showed some of her students. Uh, to go out with her up to the mesa and uh, harvest the clay. And once they harvest the clay, she brought it home, uh, over to their home, and kind of just pile it up in the middle of the room and uh, separate. Uh, so did her son-in-law, your dad, help her uh, find no, some of her no. materials? my grandfather did. Your grandfather yeah. did? Yeah. Uh -huh. My father was, you know, working still with the for for service. Ah, oh, uh huh. Yeah. So he could go exploring on his own and look for things. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of following his footsteps. You yeah. Know. Um, I used to run a lot. Our, my family was a all, all my uh, family were runners, so I used to run around the reservation and I will find things, you know, uh -huh. like different kind of um, uh, pottery shards. Um, when I uh, come upon a, a ruins, that's where I kind of just go around looking for things, you know, see well, all you, the pottery shards. You know, I read somewhere that the, the land that the Zunis occupy um, was settled, I mean, there are archaeological ruins there that are 4,500 years old. I mean, really, really old. And uh, that, uh, you know, those ruins still exist in, in Zuni today. Maybe it was some of those very ancient ones. And then, of course, the, the Pueblo of Zuni was occupied uh, during all the Pueblo phases uh, uh, until um, the Spanish showed up and then things got a little dicey uh, once the Spaniards were there. But to have, you know, prehistoric villages on your uh, land that uh, were 4,500 years old, that's, you know, that's almost as old as the pyramids in Egypt. Yeah, um, like like when the Spaniards, I think the Spaniards brought o brought over a different kind of trees, and we have uh, peach orchards up in uh, the Twin Buttes area, uh -huh. and there's only two trees that's left. They usually had like about so many trees up at the uh, peach orchards, as they call it. And I'm the one that's taking care of that Those orchids. old trees? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, I know that peaches were really highly prized uh, by the Spaniards. In fact, uh, one of my house, I was told, was uh, a structure that was traded for a good traveling horse and a sack of peaches because peaches were really, really special during that era. They also brought a lot of um, apple trees 
uh, to the area as well. And uh, I guess those are maybe some of the good things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But so those peach trees have to be several hundred years old. I, I was asking my um, aunts and uncles uh, about that peach orchard. And what they told me was that their parents used to go up there to the orchards and take care of them. Uh -huh. And right now, my uh, the other aunt is probably in her 70s now. Yeah. And she told me that she was like a little girl being taken up there and uh, taking care of the peach orchards. Yeah. And it's probably like, uh, I asked her when when was the trees planted, and she didn't know he was already up there. They were already old trees then. Yes. When she was a little girl. Yes. Um, how how big um, were the trunks? Are the trunks now, roughly? You know. Like it's not. It's not. It's not that uh, very big. Uh -huh. It's probably like about twelve inches in uh, diameter, one uh -huh. foot. You know, yeah. probably about that big. And it's been growing up there for quite a while, a long time. Long time. Yeah. Well, I have a, a couple apple trees on, on my piece of property that plant geneticists have come to look at because it has apples on it like no other apples that anyone has seen for a long time. And the, the trunk of the apple tree is about probably almost two feet in diameter mm -hmm. uh, and old, old, old apples that are really strange because, you know, now you can buy cooking apples and you can buy eating apples. And the cooking apples tend to be a little bit mushy and they cook up and make good apple pies and stuff. And, and the eating apples are really crunchy, you know, to, to bite into. But these apples, which are sort of green with red stripes in them, um, they both cook and eat, uh, so they 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 were sort of the combination of the um, the kinds of apples that the the Spaniards had here that they could use for both purposes. Uh, but really strange looking apples, and and you know I'm hoping that that tree was really really old when I moved to New Mexico 47 years ago, and. Uh, and it's, you know, it's lost a few branches along the way. And um, I think that, you know, it's, may, I don't know how long it's going to be good for, but uh, I'm trying to uh, do some grafting of the, the apple tree so that uh, I can have some young ones that I can plant again because the apples are so different than, than anything that you see in the, in the marketplace. But we'll see what happens. Now, what, what are you doing there? Uh, I'm, I'm making a, a bottom a seat for, for it to have the shape. Uh, of well, the a, shape of is a, beautiful. The old uh, pottery that uh -huh. I've seen. I'll let it sit for a while and get it all leather hard uh -huh. and then reshape it again. So that way you'll, you know, Less sanding. Yeah. Less sanding. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in a few minutes, maybe what we could do is go over and talk about some of the pieces that you brought with you so the people at home can see uh, uh, what you've been up to. But in the meantime, we'll, we'll just gab on here while Derek gets everything set up so that uh, he can show off your pots and, and you over there where we have your display. Uh, but you can tell me a little bit more about this pot now. Uh, are you going to, uh, you, at this point, do you have to let it dry? Just kind of let it all kind of get let it hard. So mm -hmm. that way, you know, it's kind of like wobbly right now, but the shape, uh -huh. it's, I try and, you know, you, you see an old piece of pottery and they have these shoulders. Yeah, the shoulders right gorgeous. Uh -huh. And I try and, you know, make a pot like that. But it doesn't come out the way you the way they did it 
in you know those uh, early days and this is how it comes out every pot that I make I, I try and replicate uh, an old pot but it usually doesn't come out that <laughs> way <laughs> well maybe maybe the clay uh, has something to say about it Maybe Mother Earth uh, wanted more macaroni and cheese. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something newer. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and that way uh, she, she would then give you uh, or, or tell the clay to behave itself and not to collapse or to sink in. And Yeah, because you see some of those old Zuni pots and, you know, they come up from the base and they have this high shoulder and then they dip back in again. And, you know, how do they get that dip in there so that it just doesn't all fall into the middle and uh, uh, very 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 difficult yeah it is you try and uh, replicate uh, an old pot you know it just doesn't it, it has a, a mind of its own you know yeah oh of course of course a living thing uh, yes uh, every every you know thing that you see is, is, is a living thing uh -huh. You know, plants, rocks, clays, and uh, water is the uh, most precious that we uh, have. Yeah, and speaking of water, I mean, you said that you went, you went and got spring water. Is there any other source of water? There's no river. Is there, by Zuni? No, it all dried out. As we were kids, they used, well, the river was still running. Uh -huh. But right now it's all dry, uh, all the lakes are drying out, and we haven't had any uh, rain, oh. and uh, we do uh, dry farming, uh -huh. so we so ask no for... So no irrigation, you depend on, on the rainfall to let your crop, help your crops grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened to the, the, of the water? I mean, was it the climate changing or was there a dam somewhere that was built or uh, what, what has caused the, the river that you had there to dry up? It's lack of rain. Uh -huh. yeah, there's no rain coming in and, and so that's why uh, all the lakes are all drying out. Yeah. There's uh, a Eustace Lake in Zuni that's a, Still got some water in it. There's a, a Black Rock Lake that's all dried out. There's no more water. And right now, uh, there's a Oho Lake. Uh, Oho Eyes. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> a, 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 an Oho area that's it's an old uh, village. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a farming area, too. And, and no water for no, it's, the crops. They are doing farming over there, but uh, they're using spring water too. They have to mm -hmm. uh, get some, uh, you know, those uh, water buckets yeah. to haul water to their uh, fields. Wow. wow. Imagine having to water a whole field with a bucket. I mean, it's, it's really, really hard. It's hard, hard uh, That's work. what we're doing right now. You know, we go out to Pescado and haul water to Nutria area just to water our gardens. Wow. Uh, we have like uh, chili, um, squash, corn, mm -hmm. uh, melons, different kind of uh, vegetables that we grow. Now, this, you know, New Mexico sits on top of an enormous aquifer. I mean, there's tons of water underneath, but uh, uh, you have to drill for a well. Are they? doing any well drilling? There's there? one place that they uh, drilled for water and they put in a water pump mm -hmm. and um, I don't know why some people really don't care to take care of it. Right now it, it's broken. Oh. And uh, there's hardly anything to, you know, yeah. fix that pump. When, when they drill for water, how, how deep do they have to go? Uh, they called in the uh, driller to go in and yeah, drill. Well, you know, around where I live, down in the Pewaukee Valley, which is just north of here, um, the water table is at 25 feet. You can dig down 25 feet and, and hit water. 
and there are lots of artesian springs. And I think my well is 50 feet deep, which is, you know, it was hand dug. You can dig a hole that's 50 feet deep uh, mm -hmm. with a shovel. But in Santa Fe, if you want a well, uh, you have to go down a little over 400 feet before you hit that first water. And I just wondered if, if Zuni was high or low on that above the, the big aquifer here. I think it's low. It's low? Yeah. So th the water isn't that far down? I'm not sure how yeah. deep you have to drill, but the water is coming down from uh, the McGaffey area, uh -huh. uh, from the Box Canyon. That's yeah. where all the water, uh, you know, comes from. Now, um, in the, the river that was by Zuni, how, how big was it when it was flowing? I mean, how wide was it? Could I mean, did you, would you swim across or would you step across? No, you just probably step across. Step it across. It wasn't that huge. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, we talk about the Rio Grande and think of, like, the, <laughs> the Mississippi. And there are places where... Yeah, that's where a whole lot bigger than... You know, what uh, went through in Zuni, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. We, we I mean, played in the river, you know, when we, as we were kids. But right now, there's hardly yeah. any. Well, the mighty Santa Fe River, you can step across. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if only we could divert that water to, to Zuni, yeah. we could have water. <laughs> yeah, well, now, are you on this side or the other side of the Continental Divide? Do, uh, I you, think we're on the west side. So you're on the Pacific yeah, side. Yeah. Well, it would be really hard for us to divert the water. <laughs> Making water flow uphill is a, big, is a big challenge, that's for sure. Yes, it is. Yeah. Wow. Well, are you going to... Uh, t Carlos is going to walk over there, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to um, you guys uh, about uh, what's going on here. We are doing these uh, interviews and um, conversations with potters and demonstrations and the sale of their work. And uh, we have many of Carlos's pieces for sale and, and he, is, he will benefit directly if uh, any of you out there decide to purchase his pieces. And what he's going to do now is he's going to um, go over to the, the work that we have on display, and there's some absolutely gorgeous pieces there. And he's going to tell you a little bit about the designs and, and where the designs came from. And uh, like I said, if you are interested, go to our website at andreafisherpottery.com and click on Artists, and then um, the L for Latte, latte and... Uh, Click on his name and you will see his pieces that start in descending order of price. Most expensive one at the top, the least expensive ones at the bottom. And, you know, he'll talk a little bit about not only making container forms, but Zuni's also famous for making owls. And uh, I'm sure he will be able to tell you a little bit about the owls, owls that are over there as well. And, you know, Carlos is experienced, um, is an experienced potter, and uh, perhaps the beginning of another revival, uh, as he said, that there are more potters uh, sort of emerging from Zuni Pueblo. And it was his grandmother, Daisy Hui, who was um, Nampeo Hano's granddaughter. I have to look that up. Granddaughter or great granddaughter. And she's responsible for a revival of Zuni pottery. And here is her grandson uh, following in her footsteps and uh, making sure that Zuni pottery always survives. So I am over at the display here with Carlos. And Carlos, would you just tell me about some of your pieces? Yes. Um... All these pieces are all traditional Zuni designs uh, that I use. They're mostly deer in the house and uh, the rainbirds. They're all designs that I use. So would you grab a piece and tell me about some of the designs? Yeah, this, this one right here 
is the most popular that I have. It's a, it's a deer in the house design. Uh, this is the house for the deer as that represents the forest. The lines represent water, rain, snow, sleep. And the mouth of the deer is never closed, it's always open. It's breathing, mm -hmm. it's alive. The arrow represents breath of life. And here we have a, a medallion, that's the vegetation. Mm -hmm. And this uh, is- In the medallion, I noticed that there's a break at the top. What's that for? That's uh, a, a, like a spirit line. Mm -hmm. So it's alive, the pot is alive. Mm -hmm. The deer is alive. It's, it's, it's part of Mother Earth. And this is just a small version of a water jar that we have. And the designs represent the prayers that we use in our daily life to have a good life, to have a successful life, asking for blessings and asking for a, a longer life, longevity. And this one, uh, it's a small version of a water jar. And just to remind people that they should probably not put water in any Native American pots these days. Oh, this one you can put water in. It, it can hold water. It can so, hold. so we we tell everybody that uh, although these were to be used for water many years ago, these days when you put water in them, they will dissolve and they will uh, because they're not really high fired. Um, and uh, just so that we can protect the people because the people, you can make another one if the piece dissolves, but rather uh, they cannot. Yeah, well, maybe dissolve is not quite the, the right word, but it will, uh, the water will leach through it, the slips tend to crackle off, um, the pieces tend to pit uh, if water sits in it too long. And so, um, especially in some of the Native American pots that have a really high polished finish on them, like Santa Clara and San Ildefonso. And so, um, we don't want anyone to get the idea that in general that uh, uh, Native American pottery is for water because there's no glaze on it. And um, part of the reason that you can get a nice, cool drink of water uh, from uh, a pot like Carlos's is because the water is absorbed into the pot and it evaporates and it takes heat for evaporation to take place. And so the contents, the water inside cools and you get a lovely, really nice tasting, cool drink of water. But uh, that can also be translated into using them as flower vases, and that's a, a really, really big mistake. So in general, um, it's probably a good idea that you put you know, water in a glass glass rather than an American Indian pot, because um, they're so beautiful and precious that you don't want to ruin them. And so that's sort of what we're talking about. Now, you were talking about the deer. Where is the deer, you said? The deer is right inside the house. Inside your house or a, a deer no, house? No, the forest. Oh, this is, that's this, their house. Yeah, oh, this, is, okay. this represents the forest. Oh, so there's, the these deer. are like trees around the, yes. the deer. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. And now I notice the deer, deer looks like he swallowed an arrow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Tell me about the, that heart line. The heart line uh, that gives life to the deer. Uh -huh. it, it's alive. It's breathing. It, it's part of Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. So a so long time ago, they kind of like uh, have, have, have a, a, like a, a prayer and and this represents the prayers that that we use the heart line does the heart line so uh -huh. so it's alive and, and so the are those the prayers flowing into the the deer to give him life or is yes. he get okay so yeah it, it, the arrow uh, is giving the deer a life uh-huh so 
the men go out, uh, you know, go hunting, and if, if the hunter is lucky enough to get the deer, um, that gives us, you know, a source, a source of protein, mm -hmm. the meat, the food that we uh, have, you know, when, when a hunter gets the deer, mm -hmm. and uh, we get the deer and kind of like um, dress it up first and pray for, you know, blessings. What do you mean dress it up? Dress it, you know, like um, like a person, if a person dies, we, we dress that person you up. Dress the body? In, in a traditional way. Uh -huh. And we do the same thing with the deer as, you know, like we put jewelry and then the kilts and everything that we wear. Like on the, the deer? Yes, on the deer. Ooh. And then after, you know, uh, after all that, we, we take all that, uh, the material, uh -huh. and we start How long does the, the, deer. the deer stay dressed up? Um, I would say probably like around an hour or so. Mm -hmm. So that way, you know, like when we undress the deer, it will be fresh. Now, do you uh, dress the deer out in the forest or do no. you dress the deer at home? At home. Uh huh. We, we take it home and we dress the deer. And then from there, uh, uh, we do some praying. And then after the praying, we undress the deer and we start portraying the deer. And, uh, and, and then you um, prepare the deer for putting him in the freezer. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. We distribute the uh, deer uh, amongst the family. Oh, oh, okay. So if a hunter goes from Zuni, goes out and, and kills a deer, um, they bring the deer home, they dress the deer, um, they pray for the deer, uh, with the deer, yes. and then you undress the deer, and then uh, without a kinder word, uh, that you butcher the deer, and then distribute the deer meat among the family um, of the hunter. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay, and do uh, do people uh, do? And, and I would assume men are the the uh, the people that go out to. Um, hunt for the deer. Is it only men? Yes. It's only mm -hmm. men. It's only men that, that uh -huh. go out hunting. Uh, women kind of uh, stay home and prepare. If, you know, like uh, uh, we bring the deer home, they, they will prepare everything uh, from uh, dressing up the deer and then uh, cooking. Cooking, uh-huh. Yeah. Wow, that, that, I know, and how often do uh, people, how do, often do men go out and, and hunt for deer? Well, every season that, that opens up, uh -huh. they go out and do, do the hunting. Is there any limits on, on the number of deer you can take? Um, yes, I think they, there's a limit uh, of one uh -huh. for each hunter. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, that's about probably eat one. Um, well, it doesn't sound like deer then is something that is um, something that you eat every day all year long. No, no, no. no. So you no. still go to the store and buy hamburgers and, oh, yeah, and pork chops and those kinds of things. Yeah, whatever we like, we buy. <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we do grow our own uh, vegetables and all that. Uh huh. And that's well, where. To, to give us an idea of how isolated Zuni is, uh, where's the where's the closest grocery store? Uh, we have a, a a new grocery store that opened. It's called a Marketplace. Uh, it just kind of like uh, we had a, a Holona Plaza right in the middle of the village, uh -huh. and then it just kind of uh, grew out. So you have a grocery store right there in yes. the, mm -hmm. on Zuni. Yes. Oh, it's a you, miracle. I remember we, we, being... They just kind of opened up last year. Uh-huh. Wow. That's, and before that, how far did you have to go? We had to go into Gallup. Um, 
it's like about 34 miles. 34 miles to the grocery store. Yes. Wow, that what a chore, huh? Especially in the winter time, uh, when the highway is closed. Yeah. And there's snow on the ground. And yeah. Winter time was the most kind of like a hard thing. Uh huh. Know? hardest thing that we do have to go out and travel to Gallup just to yeah. buy some groceries. Well, it's, it's you know, when people are listening from other parts of the country, to imagine driving 34 miles to go to the grocery store and not having one, you know, just down the block, uh, that just seems like it's incredible. I mean, at Acoma, they still have to... Uh, Go. I mean, they have a little convenience store there where you can buy a quart of milk and a loaf of bread if necessary, but that's relatively new there. You would have to go to Albuquerque, which is 60 miles away, or you would have to go to Grant's, uh, which is 30 miles away, but you couldn't get everything at Grant's that perhaps you wanted. And especially when there were things like giveaways um, or, or tosses, they might call them, where you... Uh, share your wealth with the other tribal members and uh, you would have to drive 60 miles and each way in order to get that so it was it was really you know it's really unbelievable how isolated uh, we still are here in new mexico in in many ways yay yay yeah, yeah. <laughs> yay mm -hmm. oh and uh, Let's let's talk some more about the the so the deer's in the house with the forest around him, and the 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 arrow the heart line is what is giving him life, and uh, and he's the subject of, of being hunted. Now I see this medallion, um, like this one here, and this medallion on the pot. Tell me about that medallion. Well, this medallion represents uh, the vegetation. You know, as as you know, like um, uh, in Jewelry, they have this uh, squash blossom that uh -huh. represents, you know, like a, a, the flower that comes out. Uh huh. Here, here's another one. You can talk about this one, which is a little bit different. Yeah, this one is a uh, uh, has like uh, three houses for the deer, and then right in the middle, these these are road runners. So road runners, birds. Yes, birds. Birds. Yeah. Okay. And this up on top of the rim, it's uh, vegetation, and mm -hmm. that's that's what we all, uh, you know, plan. Uh huh. And, the, and, and and here's that medallion again. Yeah. So all these lines represent water. So water. we ask for water when we pray. We need water for our plants, and this is what represents all that. And then up on top, the same thing, you know, all the uh, plantation that we have, uh, flowers bloom, mm -hmm. and, and this is what it is. You know. mm -hmm. So basically, the, there's uh, a lot to do with food in these pots uh, in terms of the plants and the, and the deer and the, and the what surrounds them, the, the forest and the, and the flowers and the, the trees. And, and here, oh, okay. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you for showing us. Now, uh, Aaron, who asked questions earlier, purchased this piece of pottery, and he would love, she. no, Aaron's a she. Aaron can be both. Well, Aaron, sure. we don't know whether Aaron is a he or a she, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But you can, if you wouldn't mind talking about this beautiful pot. Let's start with the clay color first. Okay, this, this clay color is a peach color. This is the natural color of the clay once you fire mm -hmm. it. That sort of peach color, uh-huh. Yes, and uh, this has like three deer houses on it with deer heart lines on it. But up on top, this is what we call a rainbow design too. So, and these, the, yeah, and these red lines are they rain? Represent snow. Rain. Snow. Oh, yeah. Oh, so the red lines are snow and the black lines are rain. Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And this is the vegetation on the uh, bottom of the rainbows. Uh huh. And where's the rainbird? These two are the rainbows. These are the head part. These are the eyes. 
Uh huh. And these these right here are the feathers. It's got lines on them. It <laughs> represent water. So. Uh huh. So everything that we, well, that I use, it's all traditional Zuni designs mm -hmm. that I use. And uh, with my uh, grandmother, uh, she explained what, what the design meanings were. Mm -hmm. And that's where I got all these old designs that I'm being used. So you would almost consider this a winter pot because of the snow? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you know, if you look at old Zuni pots, um, you can see exactly where the influence came from you, that you are, you're using all those traditional designs on the pieces that you make today. Yes, um, what, what interested me was when I go out, you know, may, maybe go hauling wood or go running around, you know, the forest, I'd like, I like to hike, yeah. And I I see there's a lot of ruins out there, and um, I see a lot of uh, pottery shards uh -huh. laying on the ground. And I, yeah, I would come upon a, a piece, and if it if it's a bigger piece, I would just kind of like kind of uh, turn it around, uh, see see what kind of designs that I see, and I try and kind of picture what kind of designs they use it's usually there's a lot of lines there's a lot of steps and uh, there's a lot of bird forms uh -huh. that I see and that what really interested me in doing pottery mm -hmm. well Aaron I hope that this uh, uh, explanation is good if you have more questions don't hesitate to a ask because I think that uh, Carlos would be more than happy to answer it, but the color on that piece is just absolutely mm. gorgeous. And then uh, in contrast with the dark and a little bit of that red slip in it, and of course the, the lines of snow uh, is just really, um, you know, it's really fun to look at. And Erin, I think you got yourself a really nice gem of a piece from Carlos. Thank you very much. Yes, okay, this piece is very, very different from um, all the rest of them. Maybe you could tell us some um, things about the designs here. These, this one is a, a rain bird design. There's two birds on here. This one is a rain cloud. All these lines represent water. And up on top, it's got some now, vegetation. Is, is this is this the head of the the bird? Yes. And the, and the this head. little circle is the eye of it's the bird. The eye. Uh, now, is the rain bird the cloud the clouds, or is the rain bird coming out of the clouds with the rain no, in it? This is this is the whole thing. It's the, the whole bird. Yeah. As, yeah. as you can see outside, you know, you can see clouds forming, uh -huh. and you see different kind of uh, like things you see, you know, you probably... Yeah, will, everybody may, looks you, at the clouds and, and yeah, you, imagine you things. You might see some people, you know, kind of like the shape of a, a person uh -huh. or face or either animals that you... you I know, usually see, see food, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and so this... The, the whole structure here uh, is uh, a bird on the top and a bird on the bottom with all the rain on the inside. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All righty. So, so this is a, a water jar too, mostly. And it has a, a lip on it that's kind of like going out, flanging out. And why this is kind of like going out is that you, if you want to put either uh, seeds or flour or anything that you know you don't want, want a store? to store yeah uh -huh. you, you just either put a cloth on it uh -huh. or a hide and tie a string around it uh -huh. so that it won't slip out uh -huh. that's why it has a lip on it oh so that that way the string doesn't pop off yeah and mm -hmm. uh, you can use it for storage you and can that, use it for storage. that hide or cloth becomes like a lid yes mm-hmm mm -hmm. Anything that you can put in here, you can 
last a while yeah. longer instead of the spoiling. Uh -huh. you know? But you can put water in it and it can hold water. It'll seep out, but you know, it'll seal itself. Yeah. And sometimes we you add pamper to it, you uh -huh. know, pot, old pottery shards yeah. to grind up. Yeah, we'll talk about that when when we're over there with the clay about temper and but you know, tell me about, you know, like this little design element. This design uh probably represents uh like a thunder, you know, like thunder. Yeah. Uh huh. And is the red are the red lines snow? Yes, it represents That's snow. Snow still. so yeah, and that's really something that you get to see in New Mexico is we have lightning and thunder with snowstorms. And mm -hmm. that doesn't happen very much anywhere else in the whole planet, to that mm -hmm. thunder snow. Yeah. Uh, are these the steps of the Kiva? It could be, you know, yeah. it'll rep you, represent all that. Mm -hmm. So. And, and this? That represents uh, the plantation, you know, different kind of plants that we plant. Uh -huh. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece, and you know, again, a very old um, Zuni design, really gorgeous. And what you've done on some of these other pieces, like the one, the very far one over there, that one. This one. Yeah, um, again, we're looking at rain birds. Rain yes. birds? Yes, there's one bird uh -huh. on its side. This represents rain clouds, and this is the uh, body part for the bird. And right up here, there's some more rain birds on there, and some vegetation. And these these are all old designs that I uh -huh. use. And so again, it can be used for storage because yes. of that lip that just turns out enough to hold uh, a string or uh, a piece of hide from popping off. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now, I noticed that there are a bunch of owls here. Tell me about owls in your culture. Oh, the owls are, as I kind of uh, been told, that, that the owl is a good luck bird. It's a good luck but, bird. Yeah, uh -huh. but some um, uh, petals uh, mostly Navajos don't like oh, owls. No. Oh, oh no, they <laughs> like it owls. It represents an omen. Uh huh. For a them. bad omen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not a good omen, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Zunis have been making owls forever and ever. And you know, we have a cage of owls here. Uh, well, we have a cage and we fill it with Zuni owls and uh, and so that they don't fly away because we like them so much. So we keep the ceramic owls in, in, a, in a nice big cage. And lots of your owls have uh, escaped and flown. <laughs> they've flown home to... Yeah, they uh, got adopted. They got adopted. <laughs> they and found so a new home. They did. Them. They found a new home. So they were let out of the, the cage. But uh, you... Um, make big owls and medium owls and yes, little I mean, owls. You know, like and I have some orders about, you know, big owls that I would probably, you know, make. Uh -huh. And usually I'm just kind of like uh, doing the owls about this size uh -huh. and the miniature ones. And you do them with all, uh, with the natural color and you do them uh, like the, the two little tiny ones and you do them with the red slip and with the white slip as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. So are the white ones like snowy owls or are they generic Zuni owls? It's both. Both? <laughs> yeah. Oh, both. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. But I know in some cultures, uh, owls, I mean, you know, us white guys think that owls represent wisdom and uh, th that... Uh, Owls yeah, are really be. wonderful birds, and, and you guys at Zuni agree that owls are wonderful birds, but there are some other uh, Native American cultures that if they see an owl, they are freaked out. So, yeah, I had, I have one potter that she 
by mistake told her grandmother that uh, one of those little gray owls was sitting on the fence in her yard. Oh, when grandma just about, grandma called the medicine man uh, because she was afraid that there was something that was going to happen to her granddaughter because mm -hmm. that owl was sitting uh, in her yard. And uh, uh, really scary, scary thing for them. But it's any, you know, they're cool. Owls are cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, well, anyway, I'm going to turn you over to Derek for a minute. And uh, I will be back to talk to you in just a few. Yeah, okay. So, Carlos, I just have a couple questions for you. Sure. And what is your favorite shape of pottery to make? Uh, you know... Do you prefer the owls? Do you prefer the jars? Do you prefer the wedding vases? Do you prefer the turtles? I prefer everything. Oh, you like you, you <laughs> yeah. like it all? I just you know like you know whatever pops into my head, I, mm -hmm. would, I would form and you know make make that kind of uh, pottery. All of them are my favorite. I don't kind of like just see one piece and I will say that's my favorite piece, uh, the shape of it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I like working with clay and uh, different kind of shapes. Well, so I have a question. There is one piece here that is uh, obviously a very different color than the other ones. And it's the little one in front of the wedding vase. Um, can you tell me about that one and why the color is different? Yes, this is kind of like, uh, uh, almost uh, a brownish color, but this is outside pit fire. That's why it's from uh, a different looking piece from the rest of it. This piece was fired outside. Well, thank you. That answers my question, and now I'm ready to turn it back over to Andrea. You know, the, the Zuni uh, Pueblo uh, tradition in some ways is so much different than uh, some of the other Pueblo traditions here in terms of what their iconography is on their pieces of pottery. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with the, the, the geographical place where they're located. I mean, you, if you, uh, for example, were in... Um, some of the pueblos that were south of here, uh, hunting is a, a whole lot more difficult because um, there are cities built around them, and uh, going up into the mountains means leaving their own reservation and having to conform to some of the hunting restrictions that the state of New Mexico has. And uh, while hunting is part of their tradition, Sometimes it's a lot harder to to do um, than, uh, than than they used to in the olden days. But anyway, um, here we are and having a little fun talking to Carlos about uh, his traditions and some of the the pottery making. By the way, how's the pot that's drying outside doing? Carlos, do you want Derek to bring it in? Yes. Okay. We can't forget See about it. See if it's it. all dried out. Yeah, well, Carlos brought us another pot so he could uh, talk about you know, some of the process that he does uh, on his pieces. And it was still quite damp, so we put it outside the door uh, in hopes that it would dry a little more so that he'd be able to uh, go on with the process and show you some of the things it's that he does. It's almost dry. And, uh, in in the big in you know he talked just recently about the one piece that was a different color because it was fired outside, and when we move on you know and get a little bit closer to when the firing actually takes place, um, we can tell you about um, the outside firing at Zuni and how it may differ, differ, like so many of the other pueblos all have their individual nuances, uh, and, uh, and how he goes from there. So, what so, are you going to 
Yeah. Miss, I have a few comments. The first one is from Bill. Bill says that uh, Daisy Hui is the daughter of Annie, Annie Healing, Healing and the granddaughter of Nampeo of Hano. Thank you for looking that up for us, Bill. And the next is from Charles. And Charles would like to know, uh, how is Carlos related to Jenny Latte? Laate, and how does she have an influence on his pottery? Jenny's your grandma. No, my aunt. Oh, Jenny. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Jenny, I'm sorry, your aunt. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, Jenny is from Akama, and she married into Zuni, uh -huh. and she married my uncle. And okay, so da I, Daisy married... Uh, into Zuni. Uh, Zuni from Hopi, and Jenny married into Zuni from Akama. Yes. Sounds like that's a great place to get a husband. <laughs> <laughs> I would think so, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean case in point, right? <laughs> yeah, Daisy uh, uh, talked Zuni fluently, uh -huh. and she spoke very well in Zuni. Uh, now, Zuni speak what la language? Um, Kiris? Kiris, is that the language that they speak? Yes. Uh huh. And Hopi speaks. Do you know what language they speak? Uh, no, I don't. No, okay. Because the, Nav the Navajo, Navajo and all the other Native American languages are really, really difficult to learn. So we have another question from Charles, and Charles would like to know why you sign with RS on the bottom of your pots. RS stands for Roxanne Siautua, and we made a stamp for her, and the stamp was made like that, RSC Lati. Uh -huh. So we used the same uh, name, um, or, uh, and Roxanne is your wife? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, we've been together over 20 years. Wow. More than 20, probably 24 years. Wow. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It doesn't happen very often anymore, does it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just where it's a uh, common law marriage. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And so does Roxanne, is she involved in the process? Yes. She does all the hard work, huh? Yeah, she does all the hard work. <laughs> all the making and all the cleaning. All. No, I do that, but she helps me out. We help each other out. Uh -huh. she's, she's a jeweler. She do oh. petty point. Oh. She does petty point. She does petty point? Oh, yes. my goodness, that's so hard. What, that, what petty point is, is the inlay of turquoise stones onto a silver base, whether it is a bracelet or a concho belt. But the stones are tiny, tiny, tiny little stones. That's, that's really a, a tedious yeah. job that oh, she does. Oh, a tedious job. And, and, yes. And, and uh, you have to be extremely skilled to do it because, you know, the, the bezels for the turquoise are so tiny and so close together. You know, if you uh, do something wrong, you could melt the whole thing down. Oh, yeah. yeah. She, you know... There's a, there's a whole lot of work into making uh, petty point jewelry. Roxanne, I know you're off camera, but do you happen to have any of your jewelry here now? Uh, not with me, but no. I've got some photos that um, I took before. Do you have the photos with you yeah. too? Oh yeah, let's show one of uh, Roxanne's petty point. It's um, all done with, from a scratch. She uh, buys uh, material and uh, a plate and some um, uh, strips of uh, silver. So these are mantapis that I did recently. Oh. And they're all natural stones. Petty Point is just really, really amazing. I want to look too. Wow. And these are all, they're pins? Or the uh huh. Uh huh. I put the pins on it so uh -huh. it can be used as yeah. a pin. So it can be worn on a, on a shirt or a blouse. Yes. But a manta is like a, a 
a, a covering. It's like a shawl, and it the montepins uh, hold the shawl together, so you're not constantly, you know, trying to close it, and so it keeps it closed, so it's nice and warm around you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, stones, put them on the sticks with the hot oil lamp. And, oh, oh. And I grind them, sand them. All oh, those <laughs> teeny, teeny, teeny little stones. Uh, so we both help each other um, yeah. in our work. But, and she helps you with the, the pottery. But yes. But you're, you're the, really the person who does most of the work with the pottery. Yes. Mm -hmm. And she's the person who does most of the work with the jewelry. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, so who gets to wash the dishes and do the laundry? <laughs> <laughs> I think I know who. Uh, and I think your name is Roxanne. Well, huh? it, it's sometimes yeah. I do that too, oh, you know. Oh, good for you, good for but you. But most huh? of the time she, she does that. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, so the pot that was drying outside, is it... Uh, appropriately dry to move on to the next step with it? Not really, because it's still damp a little uh -huh. bit, and it needs to dry out a little bit more. So like should it be? It yeah, yeah, please. So that way it'll dry, and then Is there if any it's sun? dry enough. Is it better in the sun? Yes, you okay. know. Well, maybe there's some, I mean, there's some sun out there, but... Uh, the front door isn't exactly in the sun, so we'll do the best we can to dry your pot. I didn't bring my hair dryer. <laughs> <laughs> that would work, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on a day like this, a hot day, yeah. it'll dry out the clay right quick. Yeah. But if it's cloudy, rainy, and moist, uh -huh. it'll take about two days just to dry yeah. out a piece like that. Well, two days isn't so bad. I was... Talking, I was asking Richard Zane Smith, and he was sort of our featured artist uh, for this whole video series about his pots drying. And Richard is from the Wyandotte tribe, and they live in the northeast corner of Oklahoma. And you can only imagine what the humidity is like there. He said that sometimes his pots take two months to dry. Yes. Yeah, they... not two hours, two months, which is... Uh, really quite remarkable. So I guess feeding Mother Nature all those good things, uh, she really helps you out with the, the climate in terms of drying your, your pots. Now, um, we had a question from Doug, and, uh, and Doug said, uh, please ask you, it says, you have one offering bowl over there. Yes. Uh, it's not for food, it's for offerings. Yes, well, uh -huh. it depends on uh, if he wants to put food in it. Or uh -huh. well, just yeah. for cornmeal, he said? Is it a cornmeal bowl or is it a, an offering bowl, bowl or can it be both? It can be both. Uh -huh. Well, if, if, if he wants to be using that, he can uh, use either, uh, uh, what do you call the cellophane, uh, plastic, and line it, or either... You mean like plastic wrap? Yeah, plastic wrap it. to uh -huh. line it, so that way it won't get dirty. Yeah, uh, and or, it, in food, something stain. Yeah, uh -huh. if it's kind of like getting some stains on it, you know, you can refire it just to uh -huh. burn off the stains. Well, Doug probably won't be refiring it anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> but he also wanted to know if uh, your food bowl at home, if it w was uh, had a glaze on the inside of it? No, it don't no. have no glaze on Do, it. Does it have saran wrap on the inside of it? Uh, we, don't, we don't use saran wrap. Uh, it can be washed or, you know, yeah. uh, use it for uh, different things. You yeah. want to put and food you know, in it. Over time, you can always make another one if you need to. Yes, oh and yes. And probably yeah. Doug can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, for for a piece like that, you know, uh, if it can be used for something, you know, other than you know water, it has to be a little bit thicker, uh -huh. and that's just for a decorative piece. So the piece over there is decorative. Yes. But if if Doug chose to use it like an offering bowl, 
he should put a little piece of saran wrap on the inside. Yes. Or mm -hmm. some aluminum foil or yes. something. Mm -hmm. If he wanted to use it as a cornmeal bowl, he doesn't have to put the saran no. wrap in no. because that's no. dry. The cornmeal's already really dry and not going to stain yeah. or affect uh -huh. the surface at all. Uh -huh. And if uh, he would like to have a, a decorative bowl, it would probably look really nice on the mantle. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, mm -hmm. Doug, I hope that answers uh, your questions. Anyway, so now what? what are, where are you going to go with your clay making from here? Okay, uh, this one has to kind of like uh, dry out a little bit, uh, get it letter hard so I can um, smooth it out, get all these small bumps out. And that way, you know, it'll be a lot easier to, you know, Well, you know, it. part of what this um, conversation is, is that hoping that people out there will realize that things sort of have to be just right to proceed. And that it's not something where, you know, you go to um, the craft store and you buy a, uh, a bag of clay and you throw something on the wheel and um, you let it dry and stick it in the kiln and you're more than halfway done. Um, the process here is very, very slow and, and uh, like Carlos said, it's not quite right. It's not quite dry. The other one wasn't quite dry. This one isn't quite dry either. And so you have to have a lot of experience uh, in um, making sure that you hit the, the right time, the timing has to be right in order for you to wind up with a, with a finished product. Now, yeah. at home, um, I'm sure you don't sit there and watch the pot dry. I mean, it's sort of like watching paint dry or watching the weeds grow. Uh, you probably have uh, more, you have more than one piece going at a time. Uh, how how do you balance all that? How many pieces do you, you know, well, have it, going? It, it depends on how much clay I have, and if if I make a bigger piece, you know, that would that would probably take about two days to dry, two or three days to dry, and then I will probably be making a little bit smaller pieces, and then adding on to that. I usually uh, work on pieces like maybe five to six pieces at a time uh -huh. and yeah. then while they're drying I'll go up to the garden do my chores up there and pull, then pull weeds right pull yes weeds. <laughs> pull weeds but somehow get it all cleaned out somehow you know the the plants need water but the weeds never do I mean, even though you don't have a lot of water, those weeds are they are growing like weeds. And uh, there are always more weeds than plants always. But, and so you work in your garden, and then you come back and do more pottery? There's, there's a lot of stuff that I usually do. It's not just, you know, I wait for pieces to get all dried out. Yeah. There's places that I need to be and do other things uh -huh. that, I, that needs to be done. So I'm always either out, out and about doing other things, other chores, or go up to the mountains, to the uh, peach orchards, taking care of all that. Trees, yeah. So I'm always out. Once I get back home, I check on the pottery, see if it's all dry and everything. Mm -hmm. If it's all ready to, you know, being cleaned, uh, I would do that and start uh -huh. working on that and then s sanding it, cleaning it, uh, put it aside, let it all dry out again. Uh -huh. And then from there on, I'll start doing the painting. So when I make a piece like this, I have, you know, I, I, I picture what's going to be on it, what kind of design that's going to be on it. I already know what's going to be, you know, what the design is going to be you know, on it. Well, it's going to be on that pot. This one, I look, I usually kind of look at the shape uh -huh. and I will say this one would be 
like there would be some uh, frogs on it. Frogs? Uh, dra dragonfly, yeah. Uh huh. Do you have any pots over there with frogs on it? Uh, I don't see any of it. Uh, but the turtle that I made, it's got some dragonflies on it. Uh huh. And um, as well, I. As I see this piece, uh, I see a turtle. You see and a turtle. I see a turtle. Now and tell, then tell me about turtles and what role do they play in um, Zuni culture? Uh, it represents water. Water. Uh, fertility. Okay. And dragonfly is the same. Uh, it represents water. And what, what I heard my uh, parents were, you know, like the dragonfly. Uh, it's our ancestors that's coming. It's bringing, it's going to bring some rain. And so the dragonfly is your ancestors? Yes. Huh. Mm -hmm. how, how interesting. Because mm -hmm. dragonflies are really, really important and they're absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and, you know, some of the other Native American cultures have other... Um, insects or things that fly that, mm. that come in at, as their ancestors. Yeah, it's like uh, uh, they're a bringer, bringer of rain. They're a bringer of rain. Boy, every, every other word seems to be rain and water and snow. Yes. Uh, because it's so important. Yeah, because um, all these designs that I see and heard uh, of the designs, they represent water, and that's why we call it a water jar, or either uh -huh. that uh, 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 something something to put in the jar to, to, you know. So it has water symbols on the outside and real water on the inside. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to know more about frogs, because yesterday, um, Judy and Diane Lewis were here from... Um, Acoma Pueblo, and they do these wonderful seed pots uh, that have lots of anim it's animal motifs everywhere. I mean, there are fish, and there are cloud swallowing birds, and cranes, and, and quail, and, and hummingbirds, and every animal you can imagine except frogs. And they said that the frogs were, they weren't allowed to paint frogs on their uh, pieces of pottery because that was a symbol that was only to be used by medicine people. Uh, and yet you paint, you're right, you're sort of next door, as, as next door as anyone can be in New Mexico, what, probably, what, 50 miles apart? Yeah. Uh, and, and it's okay for you guys to paint frogs. And so what do frogs mean in your culture? Because I couldn't, they couldn't tell us what frogs mean in, in their culture? Well, frog, as I said, it's, it's, it's uh, water, uh, water symbol. More yeah. water, water. Yeah, more water and, and fertility. Uh-huh. And um, uh, we have a, a, a frog clan. Roxanne is a frog clan. Oh, okay. Uh, frog clan and... Uh, I'm, I'm from a, a, a corn clan uh -huh. and uh, a child of a badger. Child uh, of a badger. Now, yeah. so the corn clan is uh, designation is given to you by your mother or your father? My father. Your My father. So your major uh, clan is, is, corn. Is, is corn and that's from your I'm father's a, yeah. side of the no, family. No, my mother's side. From you, the, so the My, corn is from your mother's side. Yes. Okay. And then I'm a child of a, a badger. And a child of badger, does that mean mm, it's from, from father. your father's son? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that's... Um, how many clans are there at Zuni? Oh, roughly. I'm um, not sure. And some, some of the clans already died off. Uh -huh. So there were so many clans... So now there are maybe seven clans. 
left. Yeah, something like yeah. that. And mm -hmm. there were originally like 11 clans. More than 11. More than 11. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. And tell me what the, what the importance of clan is. I mean, do you have um, special duties that, that, that clans are responsible for in the, in the Pueblo? I'm um, not sure about what the duties of the clans were. Uh, it's just that I know I'm, I'm, a, I'm from a clan uh -huh. and uh, a child of a badger. And I, I don't know about the duties of uh, each clan. Uh huh. Does the corn clan have any duties in the Pueblo? Um, I mean, do they take care of the dancers or do they... Uh, are they in charge of the kivas, or do they do the maintenance? And, and I mean, because in other pueblos, clans, I've, no, I've I, noticed, it's so that that function has disappeared. Yes, um, I don't really know that much about, you know, the duties of the clan wise. Uh huh. So, uh, as I've been told, that I, I was just, you know, I am uh, from a corn clan. On my mother's side. On, the, on your mother's side yeah, and the so child of uh, a badger. Yeah, that's the only thing that Badgers I know. Badgers <laughs> are nasty little things, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they are. Nasty, smelly little things. Yeah, I've um, seen badgers up close. So. You don't see them up close? I've, I've, I've did. You did? I've seen uh, badgers up close. But I uh, just kind of like, they pass by me, but I've never try and uh, approach yeah. the badger. Because yeah. they're mean. Yeah, they, they are might mean. They tear you apart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, you know, I've never seen, I don't think I, you know, maybe in a zoo a long time ago I saw a badger. But certainly not out in the wild here. How big are badgers? They're, they they get real big. Like a, a medium sized dog. Something like what well, we had a a, a dog. Um, uh, it was a half winner and half chow. Yeah. And half, you mean like a, a dachshund? You know, there's a wiener dog. Yeah. With yeah. With the short little legs. Yes. It must have been really and an then, interesting combination. Ah. Uh, uh, at half chow. So he had a, a real big head, yeah. uh, like a chow, uh -huh. and then a long body with short legs. <laughs> uh, we, we were going to um, Nutria, uh, to the garden, and he was in the back. And once we hit the dirt road, the gravel road, I, I kept an eye on him from my rear view mirror. And then once I took my eyes off, he fell out. Oh. And once I looked in the mirror, the dog was just sliding oh. on the gravel road. Oh. But I don't know if he got hurt, but uh, yeah. I stopped, backed up, tried picking him up and put him in the truck. He didn't want to get in the truck anymore. He wanted to get back anymore. in that truck. Yeah. Uh, well, that truck was going to spit him out again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I kind of like just waited and waited. And then we started rolling and started running after the truck. So I stopped, kind of waited a little bit longer. And then I picked him up, put him back in the truck, and we went home. And he's okay? Yeah, he was okay. He was okay? Yeah. Oh, but I wouldn't want to get back in that truck either. Yeah. But we lost that dog. Uh, I don't know where he went. Yeah. We tried looking for it. Couldn't find it. Oh. Maybe somebody picked him up. Yeah. Or maybe he just ran away from the truck, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure where he went. Did, did he have a black tongue? Yes, he, he did. He had a black tongue uh -huh. like, like Charles have, huh? Uh -huh. Wow, wow. Uh -huh. And so, now, did you bring um, material? Yeah, are you going to put slip on that, that piece of pottery at some point? Yes, once, once the other one dries, dries. I'll, uh -huh. I'll go ahead and uh, sand it down. Uh -huh. And we'll do... Um, either white or red. Do I get to choose? Yeah. <laughs> no, which one? No. Either white 
red or beige. Oh, what, what, <laughs> beach what, what, color. No, what, what do you have planned for that piece of pottery? This one I will say uh, a rainbird. A rainbird. Oh, yeah. good. We'd love to see a rainbird. Is it to the point now? Is it dry enough for you it's, to it's begin not, that? Set it up like this. Okay. That, that way you'll dry from we the need bottom a, part. We need a little sunshine therapy yes. for that pot <laughs> so that it can mm. come uh, in here all nice and dry and ready mm -hmm. to... Uh, uh, if you put slip on it and it's still a little damp, will the slip stick? It'll stick, but you know it has to dry a little bit more. Uh -huh. uh, uh, give it a little more time uh -huh. to dry out. But if you... Uh, sand a piece that's still wet, the sandpaper is just going to collect a lot of uh -huh. uh, clay on it. It won't uh, sand pretty good. So this one is kind of getting hard a little bit, so I have to uh, smooth it out, get all the bumps out, and then let it completely dry and then start working on it. Well, we're, while we're waiting for the sun to do its therapy, uh, we can um, maybe talk a little bit about the pandemic at, uh, at SUNY. How, how are you guys faring there? It's, well, it's scary, you know. Yeah. Uh, once we had that um, uh, ceremonial, um, the rain dancers, were coming, and that's where it kind of spread. Oh, uh -huh. the pandemic. Just the kinda... rain, the rain dancers. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so you did some rain dances at. Uh, yeah, that was. Did, did they? They did. Did they work? <laughs> sometimes. They, yeah. You know, sometimes, sometimes. Yes. Not. Sometimes. No. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so, have have there been a lot of people diagnosed with? Uh, um, yeah, the that's. Virus? You know, from 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 that uh, ceremony, you know, that it, it just kind of spread. It. Uh -huh. uh, all the people that had tested positive, it just kind of spread it right quick. Uh -huh. And right now, the village is kind of like uh, shut down. You're in lockdown, huh? Yeah, lockdown. Uh -huh. Wow. And do you have a curfew like some of the other uh, villages, the other Native American reservations have? Yes, we, we, we do have a curfew. What, what time do you have to be home? It's around 8 o'clock. The eight curfew starts uh -huh. till the next morning uh, at 5. And what happens if you're out and about and you don't show up on time? You get sighted. Yeah. You get sighted. Did you get a ticket? You get a ticket. How much it's is the ticket? Cost you a hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah. Ouch. That's yeah. that's a bunch of pots you have to make for uh, the sighting. Now we're going to finish here about four o'clock, and um, by the time you know we do all the uh, money settlement and you pack up all your stuff and get your car and all that stuff. It's usually like five o'clock when you get out of here. How, how long does it take you to get home? Takes three and a half hours uh -oh. to get back well, home. That five o'clock plus three and a half equals a hundred dollars. And so uh, what can you do? Can you, uh, you know, have a note from the teacher or your or your, oh, or yeah. your mother we, that we said, have to have some kind of note yeah. to take, you know, to show show that I was over there. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, they'll be able to watch this video. Uh, oh, about by the time you get to the front gate of of Zuni, because I assume there's only one way in and out now. Two ways. Two ways. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Either, one, um, one, one uh, going in, uh, that's the east, and one that's going out is at the uh, west, yeah. uh, going towards Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, they'll be able to see that you are actually here. So, you know, we may even end a little bit early, so we're not putting Carlos in that position that he has to 
beg to get into his house <laughs> <laughs> or pay a hundred dollars uh, because you know they wouldn't be able to read Derek's handwriting uh, saying where he was and, and what he was up to but uh, we want to make sure that we are as respectful of, of your regulations there because no one wants that uh, virus to, to spread anymore, that's for sure. Have people at Zuni died from it? Uh, several did. Several, several did. Uh -oh. uh, my, uh, on my uh, family side, uh, my uncle uh, passed away uh, with that COVID. Oh. And uh, his, her uh, wife passed away from that, just following each other, and yeah. their daughter, too. And the daughter also? Yes. Oh, so. my goodness. And how old is, was your uncle? He was probably in his six, late 60s, yeah. and her, I mean, his wife, uh, somewhere around there, and their daughter uh, was probably somewhere in her 50s. Uh-huh. Yeah, so uh, that was a sad thing. You know. Yeah, no kidding. You know, we had to uh, uh, bury him, you know, not even yeah. dress him up. Oh, that. you couldn't you couldn't do he, the, you know, it, the he, traditional he, burial. No, he was he was in a bag, so yeah. that was really sad. You didn't yeah. really see him. So we, we got some help from uh, this one person, and uh, he was telling us and uh, dressing us up in layers. And yeah. uh, the face mask, we had to have uh, triple the face mask yeah. on it, and a face shield, and the whole suit and everything. Gloves, triple, oh. triple gloves. So it was like hazmat. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, and that's terrible. Uh, but uh, I, I'm glad that you're here with us and that uh, everything's okay. Is everybody at the, the Pueblo being tested? Yes. A mm -hmm. lot. Have you uh, been, been tested? I have been tested. Uh -huh. uh, it came out negative. We've, we've both been tested. Uh, uh, the family have been tested. Uh -huh. They got all negative, so we're, we're good. You're good to go. Well, yeah. That's good. I'm good. glad mm -hmm. that you're here. But, um, uh, Derek, you're going to um, switch things around in just a minute? Okay. And uh, maybe then uh, your pot will have a little chance, the one outside, to catch a few rays and uh, be nice suntan. and dry. <laughs> and, then, and then you get a suntan, exactly. Uh, that's not hard to do in the New Mexico sun, that's for sure. And, um, and then... What I'm going to do is talk to, to people a little bit while you have a little, a bit of a lunch break. You know, we can easily do this, slide people in and out um, when there's more than one um, exhibitor. But when there's only one, then the only person that's going to be talking to you is, I'm afraid you're stuck with me. But anyway, I, I just want to reiterate while we, why we are here. We have been uh, doing these um, conversations with the potters. And, you know, it's so different doing these one-on-one -on -one for a long time because, you know, as people relax and start talking about their childhood and what happens in their pueblos and... And it's more than just pottery making. And it's information that really isn't available anywhere else, especially to outsiders, you know, like me. And uh, it's really a joy to, to hear all the stories and all the experiences because in some ways it's very, very, very different. I mean, yesterday, Carolyn, Con no, not Carolyn, Diane Lewis was telling us uh, about the fact that, you know, she was growing up in the 60s at, at Acomo Pueblo and she didn't own a pair of socks. She did not have a, literally did not have a, a pair of socks and uh, had to sort of borrow her father's socks and, and turn the toes under because the, the socks were too long so that she had socks to, to wear to school. And, 
You know, those are experiences that uh, so many of us can't even imagine, much less ever uh, go through it. And, uh, and also, you know, she talked about the fact that they're really relying on the food bank because not only do she and her husband live together, but they also have their, uh, their one daughter and her children and her other daughter who is uh, in college uh, is... Um, you know, doing all of her college work at home on the computer. And so it's a, rather a large family group inside of her house right now. And uh, they depend on the food bank so that they can, uh, uh, so they can eat. And uh, for so many of the potters uh, and, and all the artists from Indian Market, they were relying on their... Um, income from Indian Market and from all the other venues. I think the Herd in, in, um, in Phoenix, Arizona, the Herd Museum in Phoenix, Arizona, which has a big show right at the beginning of March, that was really the last one and there hasn't been anything uh, since. And so, you know, we're here to help Carlos and his family by selling his pieces and um, we are still buying pieces from potters. We are still paying our employees. We're still accepting consignments and we're still closed. And if you're in the Santa Fe area and would like to come in, just give us a call. Uh, the number's plastered all over our website and of course on all the windows in the gallery. And uh, we will gladly let you in. Uh, you, before I was saying, you know, after four o'clock when these uh, conversations end, but after tomorrow, it will sort of be any time. But there's always someone here because we want to make sure that if potters have work that they want us to buy, that we are available. And at the end of all this pandemic, I'm going to have the biggest inventory in the in the world. But that that's okay because, you know, they're beautiful, traditional, um, handmade, extraordinarily part of America and, and quality work. And, you know, I've always been under the, uh, the idea that quality sells. Quality always sells. It's, the, it's the, the junk that comes and goes. But, I mean, we always look for the best quality no matter what the price is, and so it is, uh, it's really exciting for us to still buy from the potters. And when we're gonna reopen? Well, that's sort of up in the air. The, our governor yesterday morning said that restaurants could now open with interior uh, dining at 25% at capacity, and I know 25% isn't gonna keep a lot of them in business, but at least with uh, uh, the number of, of infections and the number of deaths, things are, are going down here. Uh, New Mexico is really unusual, and that's because uh, there's a little tiny part of our state, which is in the northwest corner, the, in the Four Corners area, that, uh, house, that has uh, where the, the Navajo Reservation bleeds into the uh, the state of New Mexico, and they've been so hard hit. And, you know, what you can tell from a lot of these conversations we've been doing is how important family is. And they live in family groups. And like Carlos was talking about, aunt and uncle and cousin uh, who unfortunately succumbed to the, the coronavirus, that uh, that is, was really true on the Navajo Reservation. And I don't know if you've ever been out there, but there are lots of places where there's still no electricity, no water, no communications, no television sets, nothing to even know that there was a virus going on in and, and huge isolation. And there are some people that, you know, their closest neighbor is 20 miles away. And consequently, the, the virus spread there very quickly. And half the cases in the state of New Mexico are from that small corner in the, 
um, in the north in the northwest corner of, of New Mexico that is part of the Navajo reservation. But other than that, we're doing pretty well, and we have a great governor who's really really protecting us. And uh, but anyway, uh, the reason that we're having all of these uh, demonstrations and conversations is to make sure that uh, we that some of our favorite people have some resources, uh, some way to, to earn some income over this time period. Well, we have one more of these to be filmed uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock Mountain Time. And the person who is going to be our honored guest is Marilyn Ray. And Marilyn is from Acoma Pueblo, and Marilyn makes storytellers. And Here's an example of one of her pieces. I mean, they're, they're absolutely gorgeous. And if you notice how happy, how happy all the kids are, even the cats and the dogs are happy. The butterflies are happy. But what she's going to do is construct one of these storytellers for us and hopefully do some of her painting and explain the the process and the nuances from uh, her particular Pueblo. And um, what I have learned, and I've been in this business since the dinosaurs were on the earth, but uh, what I have learned is all of the, what, that the process is all the same. I mean, that's a given. But what kind of tools people use and uh, how inventive they are in terms of achieving uh, their great final product, uh, how they have to know so much about the area that they live in and all the materials that they deal with, uh, and uh, what sort of uh, sands and clays make different colors. I mean, I remember Kathy Lone Wolf, who was married to Joseph Lone Wolf, is from Santa Clara Puebla who was one of the first people that used lots of coloration on his pots and painted very, very realistic uh, animals and people. And Kathy said that, you know, he could tell whether the, the brown dirt, the light brown dirt produced a green color and the dark brown dirt produced an orange color. And not only could he do that, but uh, he would they'd be driving in the car, and uh, Joseph would say, Kathy, stop, stop, and he'd get out of the car, and he'd walk back, you know, the 100 feet that it took her to break the car and scoop up a little of uh, the dirt so that he could take it home and use it for paint. And she said not only could he tell uh, what color that the dirt along the road was going to produce, but he could also, he could do it at 50 miles an hour. Uh, which was, you know, pretty exciting. But Marilyn's going to do storytellers tomorrow, and and I've told people in in other of these videos that there are some people who come in and ask for storyteller dolls. Well, they're not dolls; they're not playthings. That's for sure. And if nothing else, they break. Uh, but they are really effigies of grandparents, and the grandparents are surrounded by their children. And what they're doing is they're telling their grandchildren the stories of their culture. And um, the, the Native American languages, for the most part, are not written down. And there's only one English Native American language, which is Navajo, that has a, sort of a semblance of, of a dictionary. And uh, so the grandparents are also there to teach their grandchildren the native language. And the reason that it's grandparents, it's just like every other culture, like our culture, whatever, or your culture, whatever culture uh, you belong to, um, that the generation in between, the mothers and the fathers, are too busy working. So grandma and grandpa uh, tell the stories of their past and continue on the culture. So Marilyn will be here tomorrow from 11 until 3 mountain time and we really look forward to her. She's one of the Lewis girls, one of the Giggle sisters. 
that are just absolutely incredibly talented and, and uh, forthcoming and fun to be around. So I think we should have a, a really good day tomorrow with her. Now, Carlos's pieces are all available. Um, you will be able to see them um, not only on our camera here, but you'll be able to get a much better view if you go to our website, andreafisherpottery.com. Click on artists, click on um, the L words. Carlos is the first one, spelled L-A-A-T-E. And uh, you'll be able to see Carlos's pieces. The first one that comes up is the most expensive one. And as you scroll down, the prices decrease until you get to the uh, lowest price one at the bottom. And uh, if you were so inclined, uh, we would really, really appreciate your purchase. And you know, I've told people this over and over, the reason that we're doing all this is uh, because Indian Market was canceled. And you know, Indian Market for the, you know, for the people that come here, for the 100,000 people that swarm on Santa Fe like locusts, uh, they, uh, they're they here to, you know, see potters that, or artists that they've established relationships with in the past, and they're here to buy artwork. But for the Native Americans, uh, this is a really big social event that they are missing out on because, you know, many of them have been exhibiting for dozens of years, decades, and that um, they've established friendships among the other Native American people, and this is the only time they get to see them. And so, you know, that socialization is gone, uh, or at least temporarily, and um, there are lots of dances, and there are fashion shows, and there are auctions, and, and, and lots of Native food, and, uh, and so, they miss out on that as well as the income. And, um, you know, it's really too bad. And, in their, and next year will be 100 years that this uh, Indian market has been going on. And this is the very, very first time uh, it's been canceled. Uh, not, you know, during the wars, not during flu epidemics, not during the Depression. It happened over and over and over again. So this is the, the first time it's, it's been canceled for safety reasons, um, of course, what everybody really understands. And so, uh, you know, we're really missing Indian market. But we're looking forward to when we can open again. I have one employee, Al uh, Miller, uh, who isn't here today because he loves to come on the camera and and ask questions too, but uh, he, you know, he's falling into this deep, dark depression because he can't sell things. So what he loves more than anything in the entire world is to sell things, and he measures his self-worth by the number of sales he has, and when we don't have people coming in the door, he sits back in my office and... Uh, well, he kind of mopes uh, because uh, there aren't people here. But, you know, we're not going to really open until we feel really safe because uh, a lot of us that work here are above that 60-year age. And uh, I certainly don't want to be endangered and I don't, and definitely do not want any of my employees to be in danger. But in the meantime, you know, we're working on things uh, on, on the website and adding more features and adding tons and tons and tons of information. And I don't know if you notice that we have uh, lots of photographs and lots of Pueblo information and lots of bios on, on the various <laughs> artists. And, you know, for all the living ones and the ones that we deal with, uh, these are just not um, a culmination of what someone finds in a book 
about them. These are people that we actually know, and, and we uh, have made up a little questionnaire. And, and so the bios that you see are the information that they want you to know about them rather than just what's printed in a book, which, you know, in, or on the Internet, and especially the Internet, which uh, isn't 100% accurate. Uh, and so um, we pride ourselves in the fact that uh, not, we are an educational retail experience with a, a little bit of all of that together. And I think the day is going to come, we hope, that we'll have um, links on all of the uh, bios uh, for the artists that we've been interviewing. And this isn't the end. Tomorrow isn't the end of all of these um, conversations and demos. Uh, maybe it's just the beginning because we're having a good time doing it and uh, the potters are enjoying doing it. I know all, everybody's always a little nervous right at the beginning and after that. Uh, it's sort of like you joining us sitting at their kitchen table talking about um, the, the work that they do and, and the, the stories and the history of, of their lives, uh, which is, you know, I think extremely special information that, you know, you really, really can't get anywhere else. And um, so I don't know what the future uh, lies, that uh, perhaps we will do many, many more of these uh, because... Uh, we've been asked by you out there that are watching and by some of the potters who think it may be great fun. And if you notice, uh, no Hopi potters, no Navajo potters in this group that we've been conversing with, uh, that's going to come later uh, because once we have to wait until the pandemic is over because both the Navajos and Hopis have been really hurt by the, the pandemic. And so... Uh, we are hoping that uh, once this is over, we'll be able to focus on them a little more. But, you know, we're trying for not only variety in the place that they come from, but variety in the, the kinds of pieces that they make. And uh, we hope that you're enjoying this. Uh, we sure are. And uh, that you'll tell your friends about it so maybe they can tune in a little bit because... Uh, you know, with the things that are going on in this country, the more we know about each other, uh, no matter what color we are, uh, the better the better the understanding will be, and hopefully, one person at a time, we will be able to ease some of the the situation that is happening in this country. And so, uh, I you know, I'm looking forward to doing these as many of these as we possibly can. And so I think we're just about ready to talk to, to Carlos again. Um, how, how was lunch, Carlos? Good. Good. Oh, Thank God. you for the lunch. Oh, you're <laughs> quite welcome. You know, those peanut butter and sauerkraut sandwiches that we make here in Santa Fe are one of our specialties. No, that's not true. I mean, just, I can't help it. I just can't help it. Well, did uh, your pot catch enough rays outside? Oh, yeah, I think it's good enough. Okay, well, then let's uh, see what you're going to do with it. Let's do the sand in, see. You're, you're digging around for something, huh? You're finally going to use a yes. tool? You're going to use a tool? Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's a miracle. And your tool happens to be a piece of sandpaper? Sandpaper, yes. Uh -huh. A little star sand in it. Well, you know, when the Zunis were making pots 200 years ago, or even before that, they didn't have sandpaper. What did they use? No, they didn't have no sandpaper, but they used um, uh, lava rock. Lava rock? Yeah, lava uh -huh. rock that they used to uh, smooth out the surface of uh, 
that's the part that they make. And the, the lava came from uh, the big volcano that was in the Valle oh, Grande? They, they call it black rock up there, so uh -huh. you can just, there's, there's some lava uh, rocks up there. Well, between, um, what is it, Grants and you guys, um, there is a place called, what, the Badlands, uh, where it's all lava rock, and it's all black, and it's all really dangerous because it's um, thin black, uh, almost like glass. And in some places, it's you know it's a, it's an old lava flow, and it's in really thin in some places. And you can, if you step on the places where it's really thin, you can fall through. Oh, and yeah. um, I think they call it the Badlands. Mm -hmm. Is that what it? I don't remember. I'll. I'll uh, but anyway, the um, that area has a tremendous amount uh, of lava rock, and uh, it's right off the highway and it's really interesting to see if you're ever driving along uh, yeah. Route 40. Uh -huh. That um, Highway 53, go, just going into Grants, uh, uh -huh. uh, they have that uh, Zuni Ekama Trailhead. Uh -huh. there, there's a lot of... Uh, so that's where they, used, where they used to collect it and use it instead of now going to Home Depot. Oh and yeah, buying, and buying sandpaper. Uh huh. <laughs> I think we have some questions and comments. We have one question at the moment, and it's from Rudy. Rudy says that he has adopted one of Carlos's miniature owls. All right. Oh. <laughs> and we the watched. New home. And we watched him make a pinch pot. Could he please describe the process of making an owl, which has thin walls but essentially is a closed figure? Um, so how do you make an owl? Making an owl is just, you know, uh, using two miniature bowls. So you make two bowls? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. And then just connecting right in the middle. Uh -huh. And then from there on you just uh, make the feathers and the horns. And the wings. And the beak. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you attach them on? Yes, uh, just attach it. Uh, uh, the wings, the beak, and the horns on. Now, is there a place for the air to escape? Yes, they from from the beak, the mouth, uh -huh. and the rear end. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds rather human, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> the it's, two escape routes. It, yeah, it's uh -huh. uh, part of uh, Mother Earth, so it has to have, uh -huh. you know, some openings. Yeah, well... And also, you have to have some openings, too, because when you fire it, if you didn't have any openings, that poor little owl would explode. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, because air um, heats faster than the clay body, and uh -huh. air expands when it heats. Yes. And it's kind of the way popcorn works. And yes. So uh -huh. even the, the seed pots that, like, Judy and... Uh, and Diane made yesterday, uh, there's always a little hole hidden somewhere so that the air can escape. And so we know where the, the um, air escapes from the owls now. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. it's true. It's, it has to breathe. It has, it to, has breathe. to breathe. And uh, has to have an opening at the mouth. Uh -huh. so, uh, that's how I uh, make my owls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope so, that answers the question. The owl is a, a, a living thing. Uh-huh. Uh, a living bird, so it has to have an opening, it has to breathe. Which are special at Zuni, unlike other place, other uh, Native American tribes, owls are good luck. Yes. Uh, and some, some tribes say that it's an omen for them, uh -huh. and they're... Uh, uh, Bringer of death, as they call it. Yeah, mm. the bringer yeah. of death. And, you know, I can understand that because Derek and I were hiking up in the Barrancos when he was just a little guy. And yeah. we sort of, and oh, the Barrancos are a craggy ridge that is near um, my house. And uh, we crossed the mighty Pewaukee River, which means that we could step across it. And we you know, went up the the arroyos, the dry riverbeds in the Barrancos, 
And we wound up in that canyon, and, you know, just a little canyon. We're not talking like the Grand Canyon or any canyons like that, but just like a little canyon. There was no way out of it, I should say, other than going straight up. And at the end of that canyon, there was a, a snowy owl, and the owl saw us, and he flew away. But he flew away towards us because... It was too hard to go straight up like a helicopter. <laughs> and so he flew towards us. And when he flew away, we could not hear a sound. Um, usually when big birds like that fly, you can hear the, the air moving uh, when their wings flap. And that owl, we could not hear one single sound. And if we hadn't seen it, we wouldn't have known that it flew past us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's, you know, death comes silently at night. And um, that's part of the owl ritual with some of the Pueblos. But not for you guys, and certainly not in my culture. Uh, owls are old and wise. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I've heard some of my um, customers say that owls are uh, wise. Wise, uh-huh. And, and they like owls. You know, yeah. Uh-huh. Now, with the, the powder that you're sanding off, uh, the powdered clay that's coming off that pot, are you going to save that? Yes. It's, it's just going to go back into the uh, bucket of water and uh -huh. uh, re-soak it, and then it's going to be re-screened. Yeah. So, well, so know, we don't, I don't waste any uh, of the clay. Well, of course you don't waste the clay, because then you've got to carry those heavy rocks yeah. out and do all that stuff to get it. Yeah. Risk your life by trying mm -hmm. to dig it out from underneath a big boulder. Uh, uh, I would imagine that every, every teaspoon of it counts. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. it does. Um, I, I, if, if, if there's a lot of uh, sanding, um, it, you can just go ahead and put it back in uh, the bucket to uh, uh -huh. re-soak and then re-screen and this will probably make one owl, small owl. <laughs> the, I noticed your sandpaper is two different colors. Is it yes, two different is, grades? This is 60 grit that I'm using. Uh -huh. It's uh, more rougher than uh, this one, this is 40, mm -hmm. 40 grit. So that way, you know, with all these rough sanding uh, lines, yeah. I'll use this and make it more uh, uh, smoother. Uh -huh. And then I'll just go ahead and use water to uh, smooth it out and let it all dry out again. And uh -huh. then from there, if I'm applying the white slip, or the red slip, or if, if I'm going to be, you know, just uh, living as is uh, uh, the, the peach color, yeah. uh, I'll use a, a stone, well, a polishing you, stone. When you first started, those two pots were the same color, except the, um, the one that you're sanding was a little lighter in color uh, because it was dry. But now yeah. the color is very different. This it's was, almost has like a, that orangey, yellow, peachy colored hue to it now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was probably about the same size. Uh -huh. The clay, when it dries out, it'll shrink. Yeah, a whole bunch, looks a like. Whole, a whole, uh, it'll probably shrink about a quarter inch uh, drying out. And cool. then from sanding, it'll shrink some more. And then in the firing process, it's going to shrink again. Shrink again. Yeah. So, so if you say you wanted <coughs> to make a 10 inch pot um, of having a, a pot that was 10 inches as the final product, how big would you have to make it when you were forming it when the clay was wet? It'll probably be like about 11, 11 inches. It'll shrink about. It will an inch. shrink at least <coughs> an inch. Yes. Uh huh. Because of the drying part, it's going to shrink. And then the firing part, uh, it's going to shrink some more. And it shrinks the most in the drying or in the firing? Um, probably the firing part. Uh -huh. gonna, no, the drying part is going to shrink more. Yeah. It's kind of like 
uh, dries out. All the water goes away. All, all the, yeah, it evaporates. Uh -huh. And then with the uh, sanding part, you have to sand a little bit. And that's where, you know, uh, it'll shrink some more. Well, you know, we have some really big pots in here, um, which people can't see, but there's a big Yakima pot right here in the, the window. Can you imagine how big that pot had to be when they were first forming it with the the clay? I mean... Y yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, right now it's, what, about 24 inches, two feet high? So uh, you would have to add... I mean, it would have to be much bigger mm -hmm. in order for uh, it to turn out as large as it is now. Yeah, I think uh, I made a, a pot that size. You uh, did? Yeah, I did. How and many times? Just once. Just I, once. Just <laughs> once. That was my first. That's what I figured. That was my first big pot that I made. Mm. Well, did it make it through the firing? Yes, it did. Whew, miracle, huh? Yeah. Someone was on you. Someone was looking down on you. Yeah. The firing process is, you know, uh, the safest is, you know, doing, doing the firing with the kiln. Uh-huh. But uh, doing the outside pit fire, that's really risky, uh, of, you know, firing a big pot. Oh, yeah, a big pot and like you that. You gotta have to kind of like, put everything aside, your, your, your mind would be clear yeah. of everything, you, you know, all the things that's in your head, put, put the bad things away and, and doing the outside firing has to, your mind has to be clear. And, ho and hope for the best. Yes. And hope for the best. Well, so, you can imagine if you're trying to build a fire, you have to keep the temperature on that enormous pot pretty even because, it, like you said, it's shrinking in the firing process. And if one side is shrinking and the other side isn't shrinking, mm -hmm. uh, you wind up with uh, lots of big cracks. Yeah, that's the only thing that, you know, you don't want that to happen. It's no kidding. Yeah. So my firing part, uh, the outside pit firing, I use uh, sheep manure, sheep, sheep dung. Sheep, uh, okay. Yeah. We've heard horse and we've heard cow so far. Yeah. So now a sheep has entered yes. into the process uh -huh. too. Yeah, because uh, I get my uh, sheep dung uh, from a corral. Uh -huh. So, you know, once, once the sheep are uh, pent inside, yeah. they step on their, you know, uh, man manure and that's where it's all getting compact. Uh -huh. And I have to use the shovel to uh, take the uh, sheep manure out uh -huh. and let it all dry out. I know this is a really crazy question to ask, but we know what cow pies are and call that for a reason. And we know what horses look like because everybody who's even lived in a city and has ever seen a parade uh -huh. uh, knows what uh, uh, Horse manure looks like um, sort of like charcoal briquettes. What does sheep manure look like? It's it's caked. It's you know in the corral. Yeah. Uh, you have but to I mean, pry but, it out. But when it's sort of coming out, is it like pellets or yeah, like little it, round balls? At or? first, yeah it's, yeah, it's like pellets, but uh -huh. you know, yeah. But they stomp it all down for you. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it has to be. You uh, can shovel it out. Yes. This, mm -hmm. The thicker they are, the harder it is to dry it out. You have to leave it, you know, outside to let it all dry out, just like the clay. Uh -huh. uh, so that way, once once you uh, uh, fire it out, it'll stay lit for a long time. So, and it depends on how thick of a wall that you put around uh -huh. the pot. Now you have pots. one piece on the display that was uh, ground fired. You use sheep manure for that. Yes, yes, and, I did. And uh, are there any potters at Zuni who are ground firing? Uh, they don't really. Uh, uh, hardly anybody does uh, the sheep manure firing. Yeah, not and, anymore. Um, some do, but I taught some some of the potters how to fire uh -huh. uh, the outside pit firing. 
But isn't yeah. that isn't that a, a a very precarious way? What do you have there, Mr. Derek? I have a picture of pit firing. And is that Carlos doing it? Yes, it is. And it's a very big pot. It looks like. The smaller pieces I did outside, that's, yeah. you know, like, not risky. Uh, yeah, really. Doing the smaller pieces. Really? Oh, the, the smaller pieces aren't that risky. Yeah, yeah. But the bigger pieces. Yeah, because oh, yeah. the bigger pieces, you have a, a pretty good design on it, and you uh -huh. don't want that to, you know, get wasted. Yeah. Uh, a and lot of would, work goes into it. And it would be wasted because the smoke... Hitting the or the flames no, it, hitting it the, the pot on how it's fired. If if there's an air bubble in it, it might pop or if you know it might crack. And there's a, a sample that I have that's been fired out that had been fired outside. There was an air bubble. Uh oh, and it popped out. Oh, right here. See, this had an air bubble in it, and it wasn't uh, clean enough, so it popped out, and that that you don't want that. No, you don't want that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just a, a, a sample of a, a outside firing. Mm -hmm. and so when you fire with sheet manure, does it smell any different? Or a lot it, of smoke. A lot of smoke. Yeah. And uh, uh, and what does it does it smell bad? Do you smell bad afterwards? If you keep close to the fire, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I had some uh, complaints about our neighbors firing <laughs> outside my yeah. house. So we go out to Nutria areas. So so you know, that there's no nobody around there's there. There's no neighbor complaining. No neighbor complaining. Well, we had Sammy Naranjo and uh, Melanie Gutierrez, his significant other, and they talked about firing outside. And I asked them, uh, what did the, the firing smell like? And instantaneously, they both said at the exact same time, they said it smelled like money. <laughs> <laughs> Which, um, I mean, they were really happy to uh, uh, have, but they said that listening to the fire was the scariest part because occasionally they would hear that popping sound and they knew something was destroyed in that firing. And, you know, you never know uh, whether it's going to be one piece or it's going to be all the pieces and uh, not until after everything cools off. Do we have questions, Derek? We, we do. We are, it is wondering why you prefer to use sheep slabs. Uh, that burns uh, a lot hotter and then it burns, uh, you know, like a long time. It gives that off that heat. Uh -huh. And it'll stay late for a while, and um, it gives a good cooking with the to the clay. Uh -huh. and it harden it, it hardens it. Yeah. And so the temp, because the temperature is higher. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm. And so that little piece that you did is really sort of a rare bird because uh, it's been fired. It's from Zuni, and it's been fired outdoors. That yes, combination. It, it's been pit fired. Uh huh. So I did several of uh, the outside pit firing. One, I had some uh, complaints, so I don't uh, fire uh, my pottery outside uh, our home. Uh, we take it out to Nutria to do so the firing. Um, the um, neighbors didn't think it smelled like money. <laughs> <laughs> it smelled like I, I, it really is. From my neighbors, I hear the windows closed shut. <laughs> <laughs> So you obviously have the ability to pit fire outside, which is really quite wonderful. Um, how many other Zuni potters out there pit fire outside? Um, I think there's like several uh, potters beat their outside pit firing. And, and those 
are the ones that I taught them how to do the outside pit firing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told them where to uh, get the sheep manure. And so, so is there a lot of sheep that are around Zuni Pueblo? I think they're trading in the sheep for the cows right mm -hmm. now. And there's hardly any uh, sheep around Zuni. Uh, it's just the outskirts the, um, the sheep herders have. And um, I have a, a cousin that has some uh, sheep in Nutria mm -hmm. area. So I talked to him and said, go ahead. You can do, you know. Well, he's probably get, glad to see it disappear. Without, oh, yeah, clean, clean, the that's a sheep pen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's where I get my uh, sheep manure. And there's uh, other places that I asked, and uh, they told me that you can go ahead and clean out the uh, sheep pen. <laughs> and I uh, usually take about half a load of uh, truckload and uh, take them home and dry them outside. And how long do they take to dry? It takes about probably two, three months to dry. And do you protect them from the rain? Uh, I put a, a plastic over it. Mm -hmm. So that way, you know, it won't get wet. And um, I'll just go ahead and uh, store it in a, in a container. So that way, you know, it'll stay dry. And about how much sheet manure do you need to fire a piece? I would say probably about quarter of a a truckload. Mm -hmm. It depends on how many uh, uh, pieces of pottery that you're going to be firing. And how many yeah. pieces do you usually fire at the same time? The, the, the smaller pieces uh, I fired was like five pieces. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot. Oh, I bet. Because of the, the thickness of the wall that I build around the uh, pots, uh, I usually make it like about 10 inches thick. Mm -hmm. So it, it gives a good firing. And um, I use a little bit of uh, cedar wood just to- To know, get it going? Get it going. And about how long does it take when you fire a piece outside? It takes about two hours. Two hours? Two, two and a half hours. And is that from you know setting the fire to the pot being cool to the touch? Uh, for taking out the pottery, it really don't you know matter. It depends on you when when you wanna uh, take it out. I just wait till you know all the manure is all fired out, and that's when I just take the pieces out. It's it'll be still hot, but I'll just go ahead and use a either a, a towel or a, a cotton cloth just to, you know, take them out and, you know, the way to pick it up is just put your hand inside, that way you don't have to touch, touch the outside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the for the owls, how do you get away with not touching the outside? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just take away, you know, part of the wall and then just let it cool mm -hmm. by itself. And, and what then, happens if you do touch the outside? It'll, if you have oil on your on your hands, it'll make a mark. Mm -hmm. Or if the oil falls in and touches the pot, you'll have that burn mark on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And those burn marks, are they called fire clouds? Yes. Mm -hmm. And in Zuni pots, are they desirable or are they undesirable? They're desirable because they know it's being fired outside. Mm -hmm. They like, you know, some, some people like it, the fire clouds on there. And so you've been sanding this piece of pottery this whole time while we've been talking. Uh, you know, how far do you go? And have you ever punched through? I already know the feel of, of the wall, how thick it is. And, and you can hear when you're getting close. Sanding, yeah, uh, sanding it down. You hear it like you know it's it's very thin, and I've I've done that 
a couple times, and I punched through it. Yep. So. Well, it does happen, and I mean, things are made by hand, so, you know, uh, sometimes the clay just doesn't want to cooperate, obviously. Yeah, yeah. You just got to have a clear, clear mind. Uh, and the way I, I would say that I'm getting close to, you know, going through, it sounds different mm -hmm. from uh, the sound that you, you're sending. So you obviously don't have the headphones blasting when you're sanding. No. The only person that's talking is the TV or the radio. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what kind of music do you like to listen to? Rock. You like rock? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like rock, listening to rock. And is that where, uh, is that, do you listen to music while you make pots, or is it mainly the TV and the radio? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I pop in a, a movie and then, you know, just listen to the, who, whoever's on the uh, movie. <laughs> so it looks like you've gotten a good amount of clay that you have sanded off of that. It's almost, it's almost there. I, I usually kind of like that way you'll come out even. I just don't go ahead and do that, but you know. And so, just to remind people, there were no tools used except for fingers uh, in making this piece so far in sand sandpaper. Yeah, sandpaper, and um, that's it. And do you have to add anything to your clay, like temper or yeah, ground up some, some, pottery sometimes shards? If it's going to be used for, you know, things that you're going to be putting in the pot, I'll you go ahead and uh, add temper to it. The temper is either pottery shards that have been baked and if it, it breaks, uh, I use that as, you know, temper, mm -hmm. break it all apart and... Make it, make it another clay or either that, mica. Or mica? Yeah. This is mica. I harvest this myself too. Mm -hmm. So kind of grind it down mm -hmm. to a powder, powder like, like this, a sanding part. And this is what makes it uh, stronger. And it can hold water pretty well. Mm -hmm. And, and so you just find the mica by Zuni? Nutria area. Okay. So I harvest all this material, natural material myself. And how often do you go harvest all the natural material? Uh, once a year. Once a year. Once a year because it, it you know, lasts me for about a year uh, when I harvest. Uh, the material. And about how many pots do you make a year? A lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pottery. And uh, you brought this piece to us already made. Uh, when did you, did you make it the night before? Last night. Last night. Last night, yeah. I was supposed to uh, have it ready uh, but, you know, I had a lot of things to do before we came and I just uh, gather up all my uh, uh, show and tell uh, mm -hmm. material. And once we got to the motel, uh, I forgot about it. And then probably around sometimes eight or nine, I... Uh, you realized you realized needed the pot to work on. <laughs> I, I got to get to work, so I was uh, making this one last night. And then that's why it's not dry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's okay. We were able to get it dry by putting it outside. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because it's hot, you know. Yep. The air is dry. And it'll dry out the clay real quick. 
if there's and no humid. It seems like you're shaping the bottom a little bit differently than the rest of the piece. Is there a reason for that? The bottom part, the butt part, has that uh, indentation uh, on the bottom part. So that way you'll look like uh, more, more of a pot. So obviously that guy does not sit very straight. No. And so you're going to probably fix the bottom, right? Yes. Just by looking at it, just by eye. It's not really completely dry. That's why the sandpaper is kind of it's kind of sticking, sticking to it. Sticking to it. Well, we do have good air conditioning in here, so it slows the drying process. Yeah, it's kind of a little bit humid. So how many hours a day do you work on pots, generally? I would say probably close to half a day. Mm -hmm. And then once, once I get tired, um, I'll go ahead, get up and go to the garden and do my garden thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or either that, it's about time to go haul some wood. Mm -hmm. And where do you get the wood for from? Uh, different places. Mm -hmm. uh, either I'll go out west, uh, close to the Arizona uh, border, or either I'll go up to uh, Nutria area. Mm -hmm. the, that's where it is. Well, I is use. Zuni a very forested area? Um, around south side of the village, all the way around to the east side. And towards Gallup. But on the west side, it's almost like a desert area. And uh, so you're near Gallup, correct? And so you guys yes. do get snow in the winter? Yes, we do. About how much snow do you get in the winter? Uh, not quite that much. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, uh, if it's a good winter, yeah, we all get uh, plenty of snow. But, you know, I think it's the climate that's changing and we hardly get any uh, snow, snowpack. Well, uh, well, thank you for that, Carlos. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea now that she's had a quick bite to eat. Yeah, those uh, peanut butter and sauerkraut sandwiches are really good around here. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not really. <laughs> anyway, uh, so you're almost finished sanding? Almost. Yeah. 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 Just a little bit more. Yeah. That was uh, one of our potters waving from the, she's waving from the window. I'm sorry, there was some silence in there. But uh, uh, really fun, she was here with her husband, Marvin Martinez, uh, which is great. Anyway, it, uh, it's looking really good, and it looks like your pile of dust is getting bigger and bigger. So what no. is what that pot is telling you that it it wants to have what on it? Rainbird. 
A rain bird. Oh, yeah. good. Oh, good. It'll be fun. Will you be able to paint it today? Yes, looks uh -huh. like it, yeah. So the next step is to put slip on it? Have to clean it first with water, smooth it uh -huh. out. And then it has to dry a little bit. Yeah, it has bit. to dry out. So maybe while it's drying a little bit, you'll be able to go over and talk about your pots. So um, when, when you know you get to that point, uh, we can uh, have you you know, tell us a little bit about the designs and uh, the pieces that you have over there. Because I don't think, did we talk at all about the wedding vase that was there? <clears throat> we'll definitely do that. But how sweet that little pot is. So this pot with the rain bird that you're going to paint, uh, when it's finished, will you bring it to us uh, so we can yeah. have it here in the gallery? Oh, good, good. We like seeing the the pieces that uh, you have in the, gal uh, that in the gallery that, that have been actually made here. So Carlos, do, uh, do you know anything about, you know, when the Spaniards came to, to Zuni Pueblo and what happened with uh, that uh, encounter? I uh, don't really know that much about the Spaniards arriving in Zuni. Um, I think what I heard was they came in sometimes around 1600. Uh -huh. And um, passing through Zuni, um, I think they made that first stop at the Hawiku. That's mm -hmm. what they call it. Uh, yeah. They built a church uh, around there, and then it, it's all rubble right now. It's just mm -hmm. a pile of rocks, sand, and, and um, that's about all I know about. Well, my understanding is that Coronado was the first person that came to Zuni, and that um, Zuni had been through a season of dances, uh, or there was a lot of dancing going on. Maybe it was Chalico, and um, maybe you can talk a little bit about Chalico in just a minute, because that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, but... Um, that Coronado came in and they were doing, uh, it was ceremonial time, and that they, the entrance to Zuni, they had laid out cornmeal on the ground, and um, Coronado misinterpreted what that cornmeal meant. And as far as Zuni was concerned, it was, you know, stay out because we're doing our, our dances. And Coronado thought it was some sort of sign of war, and so he attacked. And uh, it didn't play very well for the, the Zuni people. And one of the, the natives that was from Mexico, I believe, I mean, all this is from memory from a long time ago, uh, was sort of hired by Zuni uh, to uh, lead Coronado back to uh, where he was headed. He was looking for the seven cities of Sibola. He was looking for gold for, because of all the rumors that there were cities made of gold. A little did he know that the gold was really in the pottery <laughs> in generations to come. Mm -hmm. But um, this guide was paid off by the Zunis to get Coronado lost. And uh, Coronado was lost for like a couple of years <laughs> trying to figure out where the heck he was in, in New Mexico. And, uh, and what they did is the, they executed the guy that was the guide. Uh -huh. And then um, with the Pueblo revolt that it was probably de Vargas that came back to build the church. And uh, because then the friars came with him and the Catholic Church came with him and 
That's when a lot of the um, Native American villages were sort of forced to convert to Catholicism. And, you know, it was interesting uh, what the Spaniards did because that it was okay to uh, continue doing your dances and practicing your Native religion, but you had to be Catholics as well. And I think that it would have been a, um, might have been better for the Zunis if uh, the, the Spaniards just said you could only be uh, Catholics and that way the, the Zunis might have chased them out because they wanted to keep their, uh, their own religion. Uh, and, but, you know, the, the, um, the Spaniards let them, you know, celebrate both religions. And uh, the Zuni is uh, pretty much isolated. The cities of Cibola, the seven cities of gold, were never found because they didn't exist. Uh, and, uh, and, and Zuni, you know, took a real big hit because of, of the Spaniards. And now, uh, does, um, is Zuni basically Catholic like a lot of the, the Pueblos and, and this, you know, that are closer to Santa Fe are? I'm not sure if... Do you have a Catholic they, church in Zuni? No. No. Um, they tried converting them into Catholics, but... Yeah, didn't work. Didn't work. Didn't work. Didn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe in my own religion, so yeah. I don't mess with that. <laughs> uh, and, you know, they didn't... And, and Zuni, is Zuni the traditional um, name of, of the Pueblo? Yes, I think it is. Uh-huh. And does, does the word Zuni translate in just into English? Uh, as we call ourselves, we're Ashiwi. 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 Uh huh. That means Zuni. That means Zuni. Yes. And and uh, is does Zuni translate into, you know, place where the river runs through, or uh, next, or or place with the the mountains in the background, or uh, does it have any sort of uh, meaning in English? Um, I think it's the middle part, but you know, uh, all these other pueblos have have that uh, middle part in them, but uh -huh. uh, a middle place. Yeah. But actually, the middle place is in uh, 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 real Grand Canyon. Yeah. That that's where all the pueblos emerged from uh -huh. from uh, Grand Canyon. They emerged from the Grand Canyon. Yes. Uh -huh. And they just uh, split apart from uh -huh. different places and they uh, uh, emerged from um, uh, the Rio Grande. And yeah. that's where all, most of the pueblos are at right now, all these pueblos uh -huh. along the site. Yeah, well, like right. Acoma came from the south. Uh, the people that are in Acoma now uh, originally were the Mimbres people that are we're in southern New Mexico, and like the people in Santa Clara came from um, uh, where, uh, oh gosh, what's the name of that national park, Derek? Uh, Mesa Verde. They came from, uh, their ancestors were from Mesa Verde. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting to see all the, the migrations. And, and, you know, I'm sure that there's some sort of a relationship between um, Akama and Zuni, uh, because the language is so similar. Yeah, um, I think Santa Domingo. Santa Domingo uh, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they are kind of similar to Zuni, mm -hmm. and they speak some of the words that they can understand each mm -hmm. other, and they sing, sing the same songs. Uh -huh. You know, if you really listen to the songs, you know, he has the Zuni language in them, and uh, Santa Domingo uh, can listen in, 
you know, understand yeah. Zuni. Sort of like French and Spanish. Yes. Not French and Spanish. Uh, um, well, Italian. Italian and Spanish. They're very closely related, and you know some of the, the words are exactly the same, and some yes. are, are similar. It's um, but similar. It, you know, after time, you know, li language is something that uh, changes all the time. I mean, ten years ago, did you ever hear anyone saying "No worries"? <laughs> no. <laughs> no worries. No. No nobody worries. Heard that. No worries. And so but you know, I think people it, say now, "No Everybody worries. understands that. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, and so language is dynamic. It you know it changes all the time. Uh, in fact, uh, if there are Spanish scholars that want to translate um, the documents. Uh, in Spain, if they find things that are very, very old, they come to New Mexico and find Spanish-speaking people here because the Spanish language has changed at a different rate here in New Mexico than it did in Spain. And of uh, that old, old Spanish, uh, a lot of those words are still used here and haven't changed in the um, the Spanish language. So, you know, that's really interesting that you in Santa Domingo, you guys, well, it's Kiwa now. Uh -huh. They got rid of the name that the Spaniards gave them and used their traditional name. So, is it ready to slip? No. You know, water. Water's <laughs> water, next. water. Water. Why do I keep wanting to do slip? Uh, water's <laughs> next. Special water or rainwater? I use spring water spring. and sometimes I use uh, rainwater, but if there's no water, you just use tap water. And you know, like when uh, a finished piece, like the one that's up there, you can uh, put faucet water in there, yeah. it, it's going to make a mark. Yeah, you know, those. Because uh, there are chemicals in yeah, it. Yeah, the chemicals that's uh -huh. in the water. Yeah. You'll sip out and you'll turn it green. Green? Yeah, you'll turn huh. it green. But, you know, spring water and uh, rain water won't, you know, do hmm. anything to it. It's, it's all natural, uh, clean water. So you brought your own spring water with you? No, it's faucet water. <laughs> oh, no, no, we can, have a, we can have a green pot. Oh, if I'd have known, I'd have brought you some rainwater from my rain barrel. Oh, I see what you're yeah. doing. You just dip your hand in that bucket down on the floor. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, there this we is, go. This is faucet water. That's faucet water. Yeah. And so that's what makes it really nice and smooth. You know, in all these little details, uh, I mean, it's not like something you go to school for. You watch, you watch, watch your and learn. Aunt, yeah, yeah, watch and learn from your ancestors. Mm. Now, see, I wouldn't be able to do that because I would be putting slip on it now. <laughs> This is, this is the only time I use water yeah. to smooth it out, get it all clean. Now, is it better to dry here in the air? Is it better for us to put it outside so it can catch some rays? Yeah, it's, it's best to put it outside because the air is dry. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's just the outside and the top rim part. So it needs to get dry and then we'll apply the slip then on. You should stick your fingers inside, like, yeah, like, is that good? Yeah. Is that okay? I think that's the way you can handle a pot. Uh -huh. um, the bigger size, you can just go ahead and dip your fingers in it and uh -huh. just hold it like this. So that way, you know, that you don't have to. Touch the outside Touch the part. outside. Mm -hmm. Because you know, well, I'm sure the fingerprints and the oil from your skin 
will make a difference. Yeah. I so. have my hallmark inside, my fingerprints. <laughs> oh, well, you know, it's really true because we, uh, um, we have two potters that are from Hopi, and they are the ancestors of um, Nampeo of Hopi. Um, Daisy Hui's grandma and Annie Healing's daughter, who was Daisy Hui's mama, um, they, they're the ones, they're the best people for identifying whether a pot is really uh, Nampeo of Hano's pot because they uh, put their hands inside and they know exactly how her fingers feel on the inside uh, of the piece. Yeah, that because way they've you been can, doing it their whole life. Uh, that way you can feel how thick of a wall he is. Uh -huh. and just by filling the wall of the pot, you know how thick it is. Uh -huh. But they just have, the, they know that, that, that she has touched it because of the size of her fingers and the way she treated the inside of the pot. And that, you know, along with the design, of course, and the structure of the pot and what the painting looks like and, and, and what the presumed age of it is. But the real confirmation is when uh, uh, Rachel and uh, Nyla Sami put their hands inside of the pot because they know that it is their great-great-grandmother's. OK, this is. Is that all a taken, candidate for the sunshine also? Yeah, this is all taken care of. Now, now for the drying part. Yeah. So while that uh, piece dries outside and, and, and this piece is drying, um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the pots you have on display. Great. So we can take this outside and let it dry. OK, no problem. Now, I don't think we're going to do a ground firing inside the gallery. No, we can. <laughs> we don't, we don't want to smoke the place out. <laughs> well, that, I don't think my landlord would appreciate it much, too, if we had a little ground firing uh, or floor firing here in, inside the gallery. But, um, yeah, it'll be fun to talk a little bit about the designs and some of the shapes that you have over there of the of the pieces that you have for sale, Carlos. And I know that um, um, your, um, your income depends on, on that because so many of the venues, in fact, all of the venues for Native Americans for selling their pottery have been canceled, all except uh, online. And, you know, so many of them um, are in such, live in such isolation if you look at all those maps about high-speed internet and where it exists, uh, New Mexico has a few dots on the state, but the rest is pretty much empty. And uh, we certainly don't have the luxury of high-speed internet. And you know, it's really too bad in lots of ways because you know the schools are closed, and that um, the only teaching method for some kids is um, online and they uh, um, they don't have that access and so uh, they're just staying at home and you know losing a year and which is really too bad but anyway I'll turn it over to Derek well I am over here with Carlos and uh, his pieces and Carlos would you tell me about some of your pieces okay. this one right here is um a natural color and it has a, a deer heart line uh, there's three deers on it and some vegetation on it and on top of the rim it's got a spirit line this one is a, um, a small version another uh, water jar that that I made is there a reason for three deer on it Instead not, of not really. It's, it's just it's just to you know 
take the space of putting the three deers on it. And but the, these little small pots are really nice because what you've done is you've miniaturized all of your other designs, like the one that's on the pedestal that has the rainbird. Yes, this one. Uh -huh. Yeah, this that one. one. That one's a little honey. Every every piece like this has a different shape to it. Uh huh. And you know every every piece that I make. Has a, a different shape. Well, of course. I mean, you're not a factory where you're stamping them out. No. Uh, there's no molds. Uh, it's all uh, sort of what, which way the clay wants to work. I would think. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Some some say that you know I I use a a mold. <laughs> Yeah. You know, make well, small pots like that. You must have a lot of different molds then, right? <laughs> and all the molds happen it's, to it's be different. all in my hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, let's talk about this this piece right here. It's a wedding vase, yeah. Uh -huh. um, it's got the same designs on it, but the shape, it's, it's kind of hard to make uh, a wedding vase. And... This one has uh, a female and a male deer on it. The female on the back uh, of the deer is a, a road runner on, on, on her back. And uh, is that significant in some way? Uh, it's just my designs that it's I... It's your design. Yeah, it's uh -huh. my design that I... Do you I, see a lot of roadrunners at Zuni? Actually, yes. I saw yeah. one yesterday while we were uh -huh. eating. Yeah. Uh, it was just running around in front of us. Uh-huh. Wow. Was, you know, the, the only time I've seen roadrunners was at Zia Pueblo and in the parking, the airport parking lot of uh, the Albuquerque airport. There, there's a... Uh, a road runner that hangs out there, and uh, but that's the only time I've seen them. And, and the road runner is the, the state bird. Now, did you also see Wiley Coyote out there uh, trying to chase the uh, the road runner? <laughs> no, but uh, I saw a wild Coyote on on the side of the road. Yeah, it was probably taking a rest. <laughs> or he, they was chasing. Uh, uh, some cars uh, yeah. <laughs> chasing the monoxide. <laughs> and did your roadrunner say pee pee? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was quiet all all that time. <laughs> well, I always, the cars did. <laughs> yeah, the cars said pee pee. I always love those Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons because the roadrunner always won, always. And the poor coyote, he was always slamming into a cliff. Uh, it was just great fun. Well, here's another bird. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tell us this about one, the owl. Uh, it has a, a opening in the, on the mouth and then on the back side. So that way, you know, it's Under the it's price alive. tag? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, uh, uh -huh. it's breathing. It's alive. It's alive. Uh-huh. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that uh, there are three different colors, actually four if you count the piece that's been ground fire. But yeah. uh, this sort of peach color is the, the natural color of the clay? Yes, it's the natural color of the clay. This one has a, a yellow clay slip on it. Uh -huh. And once it's fired, it turns red. Mm. Oh. Mm. Oh, so the natural color of the clay comes out the peach color, but if you use it as a slip, it turns red? Yes, this is the natural color of the clay once it's fired. As you can see in the inside, it's the same color. Uh -huh. And this one has a, a, the yellow clay slip on it. So it's red on the outside, but what about and the inside? The inside is the that peach, peach color. color. Uh -huh. And this one right here has got a, a white slip on it. Uh -huh. and, and is it peach colored on the inside? It's the same color, the, peach color. The peach color, huh? Mm -hmm. Wow. And tell us about the ground fired one. Uh, it's a completely different color. 
it, it's yeah, it is uh, a different color, uh, but it's uh, a natural. Uh, it's supposed to be like this, but uh, you know you don't really know how it's going to come out uh, mm -hmm. if you do a uh, outside pit firing. And this is pit fired, and it's it's, uh, it's a different color. It has that a higher ring to it, or yeah, a uh -huh. ring to it, uh, almost like a. a and that's why that one is more expensive than the other ones because you fired that al alone? Yes. So yes. you had to gather the, the manure, the sheet manure? Yeah. I, and I did, you know, like five pieces uh -huh. uh, with this one and that's how it came out. And the, the yellow clay slip on it came out red. Uh -huh. And the white one uh, stayed white uh -huh. and the natural color uh, changed its color. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the wedding vase. Um, do people use wedding vases at SUNY anymore? Um, that, that originally came uh, up here uh, north. Uh, I think uh, it originated somewhere around Santa Clara area. So the wedding vase is really um, a borrowed yes. a shape at SUNY from uh -huh. the era, the northern pueblos. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. And did they, did SUNY ever use it in a marriage ceremony? No. 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 Never no. did. It's and you know, uh, as far as the northern pueblos go, and uh, a wedding vase is concerned, um, the idea is that the the two spouts represent the people who are getting married, and that the and water is put inside the um, the wedding vase. But don't put water in American Indian pots. <laughs> <laughs> Not no mm. one that's collecting them. Just people who know how to make them. Uh, mm. But water was put in, and the bride drank from one side, and the groom from the other. And the whole idea was that two became one, uh, with the two spouts forming one family unit, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a lovely idea. And then, and then it varied from Pueblo to Pueblo as to how the bride and groom obtained the wedding vase. The, uh, the bride uh, oftentimes, well, sometimes the bride made it for the ceremony. There were other times which I found be to be the most popular that a sister of the mother of the bride made the wedding vase as a gift to the bride and groom to be used in the wedding ceremony. And so uh, even though you make this, um, the, uh, even though you make wedding vases, they are not a traditional part of the Zuni culture. No, it's not. Uh any part of uh, uh, the traditional uh, wedding vase. So when you got married, did you have anything like that in your wedding ceremony? No, no. no. We didn't have any uh, uh, this kind of pieces. Yeah. You know. And so when, when Zunis get married, what's the ceremony like? Oh, I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> I don't did, know anything did, about. Did she grab you by the hair and drag you into her house, and mm. uh, and like the Navajos, when she's done, she put your stuff outside the door. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does it, I don't think it works that way. But how does how does it work? I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> so did you get married by a judge? No. 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 Oh. no. No, uh, we just kind of like, it was a blind date. Oh, it was a blind <laughs> date. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And that blind date has lasted 25 years now, 24 years? Yes, 24 years. years. Well, I guess that blind date really worked, didn't it? Yes, uh, it did. <laughs> yeah, well, terrific. Well, that's really great. And uh, it's nice to see that uh, the female is a, has a... Um, a security guard yes. with her, the road runner. Mm -hmm. It's got a, a, a security guard, like you said. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the male part. 
He looks taller. Is he taller? Is he bigger than the, the female? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, and he also, oh, I see the difference. She has just ears and he yeah. has antlers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's how you can tell. It's not the roadrunner mm -hmm. that distinguishes whether it's a girl or a boy. It's mm -hmm. the antlers. Yes, it's the antlers that uh, you can tell that it's a male uh, a deer. Mm -hmm. and, and this has no uh, antlers on it. Well, the last time we talked about the deer house and... Uh, She's inside of a deer house, yes, which is the forest. The forest, yes. and those uh, walls of the deer house are actually trees. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. It's the forest, uh, nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, um, how, let's. Shall we put this one back? Okay. And why don't you tell us a little bit about the one on the. Uh, well, this one here on the that's turning on the pedestal. What all the symbols are are on it? Okay, there's uh, two sides that has uh, rainbirds on it. It's got two two rain clouds on each side, and this one is a, a vegetation on it. And up on top of the rim, same thing. Uh, it's got vegetation on it. It's got a Alive and the vegetation are these plants? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. These represent uh, corn, corn uh -huh. stalks. And this one right here uh, represents uh, thunder, rain clouds. Uh huh. And uh, the red lines are? Uh, represent snow. Snow. So this snow. is more of a winter pot than a, than a summer pot. Yes, uh huh. Although there's plenty of rain. I guess it rains in the winter time. Sometimes it rains and sometimes, you know, uh -huh. the weather is unpredictable. Uh, Either it's going to be rain or snow. And well, it snows in Zuni, obviously. Do you have an idea what the altitude is in Zuni? It's uh, 6,200 uh, 6, feet. 6,200 feet. Yes. A uh, mm -hmm. little shorter than uh, Santa Fe and a little higher than Albuquerque. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, every pot that I have, it's got an indentation on the bottom. Uh huh. And that way, you know, you'll sit right. You won't have to, you know, like uh -huh. wobble when you sit in on the uh, table or wherever you're going to be. Uh, Does it also have to do with the fact that Sunni women carry the wa the water pots on their head? Yeah, that's one thing that, you know, they have uh, when, when they put it on their head. Uh, it has an indentation on the bottom. So that it fits on their head, so that otherwise, you know, heads aren't flat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the indenta in indented pot can sit on a flat surface if you have it at home and want to display it. But if you want to carry it on your head, uh, the indentation sort of conforms to your head. Yeah, yeah. You'll fit. Now, when Zuni women carry those pots on their head, do they have anything else on their head to hold that pot in place? Uh, they have that uh, donut thing made out of uh, yaka. Out of yaka. Oh, so it's very fibrous. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. That they put on their head first mm -hmm. and then put the pot on top of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many Zuni pots get broken every year because of people trying to balance them on their head? I'm not <laughs> sure. I don't, <laughs> I don't. I don't think. Yeah. No, that was that was a question I knew you couldn't answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you still see Zuni women, uh, especially for special dances and and ceremonies that have who carry the pots on their head. Yeah, they have a, a group uh, that they. Uh, Go out. Stubo. Stubo. Oh, yeah. They uh, uh, carry stubos uh, too. Uh -huh. um, they put like stews in them. Yeah. And um, they carry it on their head to the religious clan. Uh huh. Mm. Now, you said that, da that Daisy had some involvement with uh, 
the women's dances where the potters put the bowls on their head? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just got a wonderful little thank you from Erin, who is a woman, by the way. Oh. And Erin just said, uh, thank you so very much, Carlos, for describing all the designs in my pot. So that was really nice of her to say that. Yeah. And thank you for doing that, Carlos. You're welcome. Oh, well, that was sweet. Thanks, Erin. Okay, well, do you, shall we go back and sure. do you think your pot might be dry by now? Oh, uh, we have to check it and Where see did, if it's there dry. We go. Okay. Let's talk about one more. And uh, would you just grab the bigger piece that's over here? This one. And yeah, and show me the designs on that guy. This this one is a, a rainbird design. Uh, it's, it's got a, a the head on the uh, the middle. Mm -hmm. These represent rain clouds. This is the body part. Uh, Got some vegetation on the bottom. Uh, then up on top of the rim, uh, there's two birds. Mm -hmm. these, these are the heads right here. These, these are the eyes. It's got vegetation on it. And it's got a, a lifeline that's never closed. Lots of rain on these guys. We need as much yes. rain as humanly possible. Yes, that's what we pray for. We yeah. hope, hope we get more rain. We wish we were getting a hurricane just for the rain. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> wish we, we had a hurricane bringing a lot of rain. Yeah, we, we could use it around here. Mm So Carlos, what is your favorite color to do? Do you like the natural color, or do you like to do the white slip, or do you like to do the yellow slash red slip? I like the natural color mm -hmm. and the, the white color. And okay, well thank you so much for that, Carlos. It's been really informative, and I'm gonna take it back over to Andrea. Well, I think they're gonna check on the pot that's uh sunning itself, is sunbathing uh, at our front door to make sure that it's dry so that uh, Carlos can go on with the next part of the process. I was looking in the newspaper the other day and where I live, uh, the grand total of rain that we've had this year has been four inches. And four inches uh, is about, oh, maybe a third to a quarter of what we normally get, which is not very much rain, by the way. And that, um, that it's been so, so dry. And you know, this is the monsoon season. And the total amount of rain at my house was 0. 0. 0.000, nothing. I mean, uh, we had a sprinkling about a week ago, which was the, it was not enough to even measure it. Uh, and uh, that's been it for August, and August is traditionally the rainy season. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens next. Uh, the fire that is in the, uh, the Sangre de Cristo Mountains is being contained, luckily. And the one in the, there's one in the Jemez Mountains too, the mountains on the, the other side of the valley on the other side of the valley, and uh, that uh, one is being contained too. Well, what's the verdict on the on your pot that's been sunbathing? Is it it's still a little bit wet. Still uh, let, let it dry just a little bit, and then we'll start uh, applying the slip on it. Uh, uh -huh. So um, you are scooping up the sandings and they go back into the clay because every little bit helps? Yes. Uh, I'll just uh, take it back home, uh, put it back in the bucket, re-soak it, screen it, and it'll become a, a clay again. Uh -huh. Well, you know, after you apply the, the slip to the pot, can you begin painting it right away? Yes. Oh, well, that's good. Well, maybe we should talk a little bit about the paints because that's 
um, well, the slip first and then the paints because that will be coming up soon. As soon as the, the sun and the humidity and everything else that it takes to make the pot, the pot dry, uh, it is sort of like watching paint dry, isn't it? Uh, that because it takes so long to do that. So would you show us the what the the slip the that you're going to paint on the pot? What it looks like? Okay. Um, what color? White, red. Well, what what was the pot telling you that it wanted to be? I would say red. Okay, let's do red then. So you have some of those red rocks? This is, this is the red color. That's red. That's red. And this is... It doesn't look very red to me. It looks kind of yellow. Yeah, once, once it's burnt, it's going to turn red. Uh-huh. There must be a lot of iron in it. And so um, you find this on, on the res and you collect it. And how do you, oh, we have a question first? We have a couple of questions. And the first one is, is do you use only 60 and 40 grit for your sanding? Well, it, it depends on the uh, potter, uh, what kind of uh, sandpaper they use. So this is uh, what I use. 60 grit. And that's the only, the only 60, Yeah, 60, 60 I, I use 60 and then 40. Uh-huh. You know, for the so that's, final yeah. sanding. And then the next question is, is do you use anything else when you mix in your, ca the sheep slab? No, just, just the sheep, well, cedar, cedar wood uh, for the starting of the fire. And then the final question is kind of a comment on the time, which is it is 2.45 right now, and uh, we are wondering if you need to be back at Zuni uh, or how long you're going to be able to stay. Well, it's a uh, three and a half hour drive, mm -hmm. so we'll go ahead and uh, well, do how, the... How about if we finish... What about three thirty? Because Does see, I think yeah, 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 and yeah. then that will give, and then Derek can quickly tally up um, all the sales you've had, and you can run to the bank, and then you can speed on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> and let's hope there's no traffic in Albuquerque because you have to go through Albuquerque. There's no back road, unfortunately. Okay. Uh. So I hope that answers someone's question. So okay, you find these yellowish looking rocks out in the wild. Um, how it, do you treat them to make them into paint? Uh, it's the same place where I uh, get my uh, gray clay. It's, uh -huh. it's in layers. So uh -huh. the gray clay is on top. Yeah. And the yellow clay is on the bottom. So if you're lucky enough, if you're pulling out the clay, uh, you see the, the, the yellow clay that's right underneath the gray clay. Uh -huh. And that's when I kind of like separ separate uh, the gray clay uh -huh. from the uh, yellow clay. And um, that's how I get my clay. Uh -huh. And then once I uh, get it out, I take it home, soak it separately. Soak it again. Different, uh -huh. Yeah, different buckets. Yeah. And then I'll screen the same process that I do with the uh, gray clay. I uh, uh -huh. get all the rocks, pebbles, and the roots, uh -huh. roots out. And then from there, I'll just let it sit for like about two days and let it all settle down uh, on the bottom. And then after, um, uh, after the clay settles from the bottom, I'll just go ahead and extract the water out uh -huh. uh, using, uh, you know, the basters. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll use like that. Like a turkey baster. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, first, I, I'll get a, a bowl and get the water from the top. And then once it, it gets close to the clay, I'll use that baster just to get the rest of the water out. 
and let it sit for a while and uh, let it settle again. And after that, get the water out and then I'll just go ahead and mix it. Uh -huh. I'll mix the clay again and then from there, I'll just go ahead and uh, pour it into, uh, you know, those uh, bluebird flower bags uh -huh. or either that a pillowcase, yeah. which, whichever I have. Uh, I'll just pour it in there and just tie it up, let it sit outside, let, let it drain, mm -hmm. sip through, and then uh, once, once the so clay what, is ready. When it's left, what's left in the pillowcase gets thrown away? No. No. No, I save it. Yeah. I save it and then uh, uh, just get the clay out and uh, sit it on the table for a while and then I'll start pounding the clay to get the air bubbles out and from there on I'll, I'll just go ahead and start making whatever I can make mm -hmm. out of that clay. Okay, so the, it's the same process for the paint as yes. it is for the clay. Yes, it's, it's a matter of, of finding it in that rock form and then treating it by soaking it and then straining out all of the impurities and in this case, you let it stay nice and watery so that you can paint with it. And with the clay, you let it dry some so that it is thick enough that you can manipulate it into a fist pot or into yes. a coil pot. Yes, get the feel of it, okay. get the consistency, and then uh -huh. from there on, you just get, get, get what, you know, like uh, a bowl, uh, uh, the bottom base, uh -huh. and then pound the clay and put it inside and start from there. Uh, mm -hmm. Start the rope, uh -huh. um, coil, and, and and so with the paint, you then, and when it's still in its watery condition, you put it in jars and and uh, and you continually add water as some of the water evaporates. Yeah, so it stays a nice paint. Yeah, if the water evaporates, you can just go ahead and add water add to more. it and yeah. uh, see that you know it's ready to use and uh, to apply on the pot mm -hmm. and let's see okay I have this ready to put on the pot apply the uh, slip onto it and then I usually apply the slip about three to four times uh -huh. so that way you know uh, if it gets fired, it's not showing yeah, the so natural color. Yeah, so the color of the natural clay isn't bleeding yeah. through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, I usually have my uh, uh, paint brushes that I make myself. Uh huh. Uh, and what do you make them from? Uh, sometimes I use my own hair, and sometimes I use uh, well, it doesn't. Yucca. They would be really short bristled brushes right now, wasn't they? I used to have long hair. Oh, 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 oh. Well, you know, in one of the, um, the videos that we did, Rebecca Lucario was here, and she thought she left her brushes uh, at home, and she uses the, the yucca plant, uh, yeah. where she breaks off a piece and then chews off all the, the green parts and the fibers that were left. And she was trying to decide uh, what... Um, what she was going to uh, paint with because okay. she couldn't find her brushes. And so what we did is we cut some of Derek's hair off because he, <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah, he has really fine hair, mm -hmm. but his mm -hmm. hair was just a little too curly uh, to be If it's curly, it's going to come out like this. Yeah. This, this is the paintbrush that I, uh, I think this is like about 20 years to stick that I am that I'm using. Uh huh. I just uh, I bought this uh, over at Walmart. I just yeah. took the bristles out, put the hair in there myself. Your, your own hair. Yeah. Uh -huh. Put it in there. Sometimes I use um, uh, a dog's hair too, and uh -huh. that really uh, uh -oh. runs out. My real dogs quick. better watch but, out, huh? If yeah. you come after them with a pair of scissors. Mm -hmm. They're going to be bald. <laughs> oh, you don't have to worry about it. They, yeah. They're all covered in hair. <laughs> yeah, well, but I make my own paintbrushes. Yeah. And um, 
The only thing is the stick that I bought from Walmart. Oh, oh. So I just... A long, long time ago. That was a good investment. Yeah, uh -huh. you don't have to buy anything. <laughs> just the <laughs> stick. <laughs> well, I know in the village of Monte Ortiz, they use uh, baby hair because baby hair is really that's, fine that's and That's more straight. of it, you know. Uh -huh. And they use like a, a branch, a little stick from a tree, a little branch from a tree, and electrical tape. And they tape the baby hair to the stick, and that's what becomes their paintbrush. Yeah, you yeah. can improvise and oh, yeah. make your paintbrushes but, but differently. But Derek, Derek's hair didn't work because it was just a little too curly for yeah, Rebecca. A little bit too thick. <laughs> yeah, and, and what she found, she found her paintbrushes. Uh, they mm -hmm. just happened to be stuck on something else she, mm -hmm. uh, she was bringing with her, so luckily she was able to paint. Uh, and so now that pot is dry enough, Yes, yeah, so, so. Uh huh. And so it's going to be that nice dark red color when it fires. The one that I use is a little bit bigger, but this one is kind of a small paintbrush, but it'll it'll do for now. <laughs> Looks like the shine disappears rather quickly, so that it's just sort of sinking it's, right yeah, into it's, the it's pot. Yeah, it's sinking in. Uh huh. Dries quickly. It, yeah, it's it's the clay is soaking in. In. That yellow is a really nice looking color. I have no idea what what. Uh, mineral it is that it would turn red under the firing because a lot of the, a lot of the other potters that we have when um, they uh, put on the slip for the firing uh, and it's going to come out red this the slip already has a reddish iron color to it So if Carlos is going to uh, leave a little bit early than our four, earlier than our four o'clock deadline uh, so that he can get back to Zuni before the federales come after him uh, <laughs> with, with their hands out for money, uh, fining him $100 for being late for the curfew, uh, we will uh, end just a, just a little bit early. But uh, we want to make sure we get to the point where we can watch Carlos paint. Now, when you, when you paint your pots, Carlos, do you uh, draw the design on first? No. No. It's all freehand? It's all freehand. Oh, boy. Uh, I, I don't really use uh, pencil to do my design. I'll just mark where... I'm gonna start doing the painting. Uh -huh. it's just like uh, looking at the top part, see so see where the half part is. Like, just make a mark right uh -huh. there, and that's half right there. If I need to make it a quarter. Just put it in other uh, uh -huh. half mark, or either if if I'm gonna be doing a three three design, I'll just go ahead and use my Fingers, so, just to measure eye, out. Yeah, sort of eyeball it and yeah. trying to figure out where yeah, a third so I is. Just use a, a pencil to mark that area. And then from that, it's so got three parts right there. Uh -huh. And then from there on, I'll just go ahead and do the designs on uh, it. All freehand. All freehand. What happens if you make a mistake? <laughs> Try not to make a mistake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, with, you know, sometimes the paint can just go glop. Uh, onto the pot, and if that happens, what do you do? Uh, try and uh, get it off with a, a knife. Try and strain uh -huh. it down. 
but uh, you know if if I apply the slip onto it and then if I make a mistake uh, you try and alter the design there on it go. instead of scraping it mm -hmm. off because you're gonna you're just gonna kind of scrape off the uh, all of a sudden, a deer goes from female to male real quickly <laughs> yeah. because the glop turns into hor to antlers. Wow. We have another question. Yeah, we have a question. Do you ever make water jars that are true miniatures? And the, qu the question really is, is that they're less than two inches in either direction? Oh, yes. Yeah, I can do that, too, you know. But well, we but, don't have but, any of them right now. And but if, the miniature part is very hard uh, for me to work with. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the smaller the piece, the harder it is mm -hmm. uh, to work. But, you know, these sizes, it's, it's okay for me to work with. Well, if the person that asked that question, if that was um, an inquiry as to whether they, they could purchase one here, if that's something that you would like, uh, either give us an email or give us a call. We have request cards. And whenever a potter brings in work, uh, we go through the request cards first. And uh, if, um, you know, say for example, Carlos brings in a miniature pot or two or three, what we'll do is we will uh, notify you and send you some pictures of it. And if you would like to purchase it, great. And if not, uh, that's okay too because we only buy pieces that we feel that we can sell and they don't have to have uh, people that are looking for special requests because um, if we really love it, it, we're happy to have it as part of our inventory if for some reason it doesn't meet your expectations. So, you know, just let us know who you are and when and if we get one and you know, it might be in three weeks, and it might be in three years. Uh, we will we'll let you know, and um, you can say yes or no at that point. And no is perfectly acceptable. Anyway, so you got the first layer on. Are you going to put more layers on? We'll just have to let it dry a little bit more uh -huh. before I apply the other uh, slip. Should have brought the hair dryer, huh? Yes, <laughs> that would work too. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we want to make sure we see you paint. Because if you do all this freehand, it, there's nothing quite as wonderful as seeing someone, uh, someone translate the design from their head mm -hmm. and put it onto the pot with a sure and steady hand. I mean, it's almost as though... Um, the, the design is already in the pot and it's just oozing out. Uh, it's itching to get out. <laughs> itch, itching to get out, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, Carlos, how many pots do you think you make a year? <laughs> That's a hard question. Yeah, it is can't, a hard can't, question. Can't really uh, tell how many pots I've made in a year. How about in a I month? I would just say... Or a week. Or, yeah. A week, I'll, I'll probably make about five to seven five. pieces. So you could make as much as, like, and you need a couple of weeks off. After all, there are holidays and yeah. interruptions and, yeah. and uh, emergencies. And uh, so and maybe... Chalico. And Chalico. Oh, we should talk about Chalico, shouldn't we? What you can, oh. say, what you can say about it. Uh, uh, because that's really important. So we're looking at about, what, 100 to 200 pots a year? Maybe, yeah. something like that, maybe yeah. more. Uh, and it depends on the size. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to make giant, 200 giant pots a year. No, that's going to take a lot of clay. <laughs> yeah, and you're, gonna, and you're probably going to make more than 200 small pots like these pots. A year, so yes, you know, something like that. You maybe know, two hundred pots a year. Maybe, maybe around there. Yeah. yeah. So tell us a little bit about Chalico. Well, coming up Chalico, I have a lot of orders for uh, the offering bowls, cornmeal bowls, 
and water jar bowls. The, and they are from the people of Zuni. Yeah, the one that's the one that's hosting the shaloko. Uh huh. They asked for that. And uh, and and tell me how is the host of shaloko? And shaloko, by the way, are dances. Um, yes. And and a cel and a big shaloko celebration. That's the coming of a new year for the coming Zunis. of the new year, and that yeah. happens when uh, between uh, November and December. Uh huh. Uh, it so depends the, on the, uh, the the new year really begins in the winter. Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Before the white chalaco, <laughs> the New Year's. <laughs> before the yeah, before the. Uh, the calendar, yeah. uh, the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. local calendar starts. Yes. The, uh -huh. But the new year for Zuni starts. When the shaloko the, comes. When the shaloko comes. And yes. uh -huh. the shaloko is a figure. Yes, there's like uh, six shaloko uh, dancers. Uh -huh. And um, they have uh, a new house that they... It, dance to. So uh, every year uh, the hostess is, is, is a different family. And how, what determines whether you're the host or hostess of the, um, the shalakos when, they, when the six shalakos come? Uh, they depend on uh, who's going to be hosting it. They, they just don't you know, Do you volunteer say, to be a host, or no, are you? No, are you picked? I am not going to say it. <laughs> no. It's 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 not my part to say. That's fine. That that we understand completely. So you have a host for the six shalakos that are coming, and um, can you describe what the shalako looks like? Uh, it's a tall kachina. Uh -huh. uh, it's how how tall? Uh, probably nine feet. Nine tall. feet, yeah. It's really, it's really, um, they're nine really nine or ten feet. Yeah. Tall. Yeah. So. Uh, and so the traditional dress of the shaliko is is very very tall. Yes. And you mm. see shalikos, um sometimes depicted uh, in uh, paintings. Uh, with a large headdress and a very sort of triangular body, and um, there's a, a beak, as I recall. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they're colorful, and they come at night. Uh, during the day, evening. The evening. The evening. Right. Yeah. I remember it was dark. Yeah. Uh, uh, seeing the shallows. Yeah. They. Come around the evening time, and um, they they go to their uh, new house homes, which is the host family's home. Yes, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and they um, rest a while, and uh, after they rest it, do their prayers, and then uh, sometimes in the middle of the night, they they start dancing till the next morning. And after the morning passes by, uh, in the afternoon, they start racing, racing. Uh, I remember it being really, really cold. It's always really cold. <laughs> cold. And the ground was really cold, and my mm. feet were cold, and, and that they were enormous and um, very formidable. Um, our shalikos... Um, are they sort of personifications of good? Uh, do they bring good things for the coming year? Yes, they come with blessings. They come with blessings. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. So blessings are usually good. Yes, yeah. yes it uh -huh. is. If it's going to be a good year or maybe, I don't know. So, yeah. so it's more of a, a blessing type of uh, uh -huh. ceremony. And, and they dance all night long. Yes, they dance all night. All night. Cold uh, night. Dark, yes, dark, uh -huh. dark. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
Uh, because there are no electric lights on anywhere, you can see the Milky Way, uh, the big streak of stars across the sky. I mean, it's really something wonderful. Now, I know that Jellicoe has been closed to non-native people on occasion. Is it still closed? No, no, no? I think... Because, uh, you know, they invite people. They invite people. And they uh, closed it off one time, and, uh, and they were kind of talking about, you know, why close it? Because, you know, it, everybody has seen it. Uh, uh, some people, you know, they come in from uh, different places just to see Chaloko. Well, and they came in tour buses, which was really kind of disgusting. Uh, and uh, there were tour buses full of people who really had no idea of the understanding of what all of the dances meant, but they were there, I think, more for entertainment than they were for a religious service because that's basically what it is. It's part of the yeah, Sunni a, a, religion. Yeah, religion. And uh, I know that they closed it for some time because they just sort of didn't want that element mm -hmm. there. It would be like, you know, having cheerleaders in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, uh, was not appropriate uh, what was happening. And so now, if you're invited, you can come to, to Shalika. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They invite people uh, to see the Shalako, uh -huh. and uh, they, they feed the people, you know, it's, it's well, every Shalako home you can mm -hmm. visit and, and uh, see, see the dances and they will feed you too. You know, they have a whole abundance of food mm -hmm. that people can just go in there, watch the dances and they can eat. Mm. Well, I think, you know, it's really interesting because in the... Um, several of the, well, the, the Pueblo people in general um, have religious ceremonies that revolve around family and they revolve around food. And the one difference with the Native American people is that when, when it's time for the food part, uh, they welcome strangers. I mean, if I had a, a Christmas dinner at my house, I wouldn't, you know, go out on the, the highway and say, well, oh, come on, you guys, come and eat at my house. Uh, it's usually, in, in other cultures, it's usually the family and the people that they uh, invite. But uh, if you are in at, um, a Pueblo and you are a witness to the religious ceremonies, uh, you're in, as a stranger, you were invited into someone's home to come and eat with them. And that's, uh, I think, a very, very different approach uh, mm. than you see other places, which is, you know, wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, some people that get invited, uh, uh, they donate different kind of food, uh -huh. you know, if they want to. If they want to, but yes. they don't have to. They don't have to, but... No, they you, don't have to. Um, yeah, if, if, if you feel like, you know, you want to donate something, mm -hmm. um, you can go ahead and do that. But you're invited if you get, get invited. Um, and so the Shalikos dance all night, and then the next day... They leave? They, yeah, they do the races. The races. And, yes. And tell, can you say anything about the races? They race among each other. Uh, uh -huh. Those uh, six kachinas. Yeah, it's six, right? Yeah, there are six. Uh, six. And these are so, running races? Yes, uh -huh. running races. Uh, uh, yes, they, uh, have, well, they have guardians. Guardians. Yeah, uh -huh. guardians uh, to, you know, if something happens, you know, those guardians would, you know, chase after 
uh, the people that's So, I I don't think we can hear what what you're saying here. But yeah. uh, you know, tell us what you can, and you know, you don't have to tell us anything more than that. Do you have? Oh, uh, yeah. Why don't? Can can you come over and tell us what you were saying, if that's okay? Six uh, shower poles uh -huh. dancing through the night, and then the next, maybe around afternoon, they'll start going down to that wherever they sit on that riverbed area. Uh huh. And then they'll wait till the longhorn goes around the whole village, and then they go down. And they're the last ones to go down there. And after that, the shower poles start racing, racing each other, and then. Um, uh, after they're done, uh, if in, everything goes well, they go out home, back home. They go home. They yeah. go home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to return again the next year. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a set date that they uh, uh, come come to Zuni to dance. Does it's, it it's depend on the, the the movement of the stars or the 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 time of the year, like Easter does? You know, Easter's never on the same day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah it's sort of... Uh, the, everything, like, usually falls on the new moon. The new moon. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the, uh, they go by moon. The guys moons. that participate mm. in has to go out do the prayers uh -huh. every month. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and so they bring blessings for the new year. Yeah. Yes. And, and, mm. then, and then they retire to where Jellicoe's go. They don't retire that day. They have to like wait for another year. And they and they yeah. will they retire yeah. to their place. They go go to their place yeah. where they uh, they're stay. Done with, they're done with the uh, ceremony, but they have to like uh, be praying like another year for the the whole community. Uh huh. Yeah. And so the praying continues on for yeah. the yes. the whole mm -hmm. year, but mm -hmm. physically then they return mm -hmm. at the at the um, the next year. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, and if there's any way anyone here can get an invitation to go to to Shalico, mm -hmm. it is breathtaking. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, if the host hostess uh, is kind enough to provide the food to any guests, uh -huh. that's what we did when our uh, family members had the mud heads, and they had to feed the people all through the night. Wow. Yeah. Have you you've been the host and hostess for the Shalikos? Uh, the my uh, sister did. Your sister and did. And my my sisters did. So we all. Yeah. Kind and of so the whole family yeah. got together to yeah. uh, prepare all the. F what kind of food do you Just eat? Different kind of food. Yeah. yeah. Traditional food and traditional today's, food. Today's American food, whatever. Who brings in? Uh -huh. They cook everything well. So like green chili stew yeah. and red chili <laughs> and pozole <laughs> and Christmas tamales. stews. <laughs> yeah, Christmas <laughs> stews, yummy. Well, mm. green chili stew is an everyday stew is yeah. every day is Christmas <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. They have but stews. Uh, yeah, red and green and mm. yeah. Baked bread, uh -huh. tamales, chili. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> All the goodies. Oh. That, yeah. All the best of New Mexico. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Enchiladas. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Apple pies, different kind of desserts. <laughs> Make, yeah, well, now it's time to eat lunch again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so now is your pot ready for another coat? Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, it's a little bit damp, but, you know. Well, all I know is if we do another series of these, I'm bringing my hair dryer. I think that will make it a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, with all this talking, I'm so long-winded, probably from way over here, I'm drying your pot. <laughs> <laughs> Bitsuni is a very, very special place with a, 
a long, long history and some very um, interesting um, religious aspects. And I think what's, what I think is so interesting is that prayer is sort of the basic um, way of worshiping. And that, you know, you pray for everything. You pray for everybody. Yeah. And the prayer is always good intentions, not bad yeah. intentions. That's, that's what all the design uh -huh. represent. It's all the prayers all, all that the we prayers. pray uh -huh. to have a, a, a good life, to have a successful uh -huh. life. You ask the ancestors for uh, uh, a longer life, longevity. Uh -huh. Oh, but, you know, the, the countryside is uh, not very forgiving. I mean, it's hard living in New Mexico if you don't have electricity and running water and a refrigerator. Um, and, I mean, the soil, if the soil is wonderful if there's water, but without water, it's really, really tough. And lots of isolation, and uh, yeah, it's a, a really interesting life here, uh, which is really quite wonderful. And you have to be hooked up with Mother Nature because she's not giving you any other options. Um, but anyway, so, and then one more coat? Probably two more. Two, two more. more, yeah. Oh, okay. Because you can see, you can tell by, you know, you can see through that that first uh, slip that I applied, and you can see that gray area. Uh huh. Which is the the peach colored body showing yeah. through. Yeah. So once once it, you can see that you know you can apply another coat. Um, you have to you know look at it. See, see where, see where that light spot is, and you just have to cover it again. And, and then with, after that, you yeah, just kind of. And like, with American Indian pottery, the striving for for perfection mm -hmm. is really important. Yeah, you can't rush it. No, you, you just have to go uh, with the flow. Yeah, go with the flow. Uh -huh. Have patience. Yeah. That way, you know, it'll come out good. Yeah, you know, just don't have to rush it. And, you know, the, the process of making uh, American Indian pottery is a, is a religious experience unto itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I know with some of the potters, uh, the value of the piece lies in the process. And mm -hmm. once the piece is made, well, then it's not, as, it's not that hard to give it up because potters don't keep their own pots. They don't collect their own pieces, and uh, unless, of course, there's something wrong with them. But yeah, they, if, if yeah. you kind of like make a mistake or if there's something wrong with it, yeah. you can either give it to whoever you want to give it to, yeah. or either that, keep it as, you know, just a, a decorative piece. Yeah, put it up um, on the shelf and put yes. the crack in the, facing and the wall. <laughs> see how many, uh, damage pot that you have on your shelf. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Then, then after you make it, you can trade it for something that you really need, like mm -hmm. money, uh, and you know, to put gas in the the truck, and to uh, uh, pay your mortgage, or to buy groceries, or clothes, or mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of things. And so, it it becomes. Um, an easier necessity to trade mm -hmm. it off so that you have things that enrich your life. Mm -hmm. You know, some, some collectors really go for, you know, a damaged piece because they know that it's all handmade and they rather have that instead of, you know, a, a very good looking pot. I don't know any mm -hmm. collectors like that. I mean, yeah, I, I, well, I've met some. Yeah, you know, people here just, I mean, they look, they look for every little part uh, on the, the pot. And we can't emphasize enough that each one of them is unique and each one of them is handmade. And mm -hmm. there are expectations when things are handmade. And mm -hmm. that is um, 
the absence of absolute perfection. If they need something perfect, well, you know, go buy something that was made by a machine in China. You uh, know, every, every handmade uh, object that you have, uh, it can't be perfect. Exactly, exactly. It, it, but, you know, there's you know, some people it, it, it who want it to a, be perfect. It has a flaw perfect. in it, but, you know, well, it's all handmade. Well, you know, I don't think flaw is the... Flaw is too harsh of a word. Oh, I yeah. think that it has uh, its own character. Yes. And uh, the character it, has to do with the personality and the skill of the person who's making it. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there are no flaws in handmade pieces because they're handmade. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Character. Maybe just one more, one more coat. One more coat, oh good. So we have a nice comment from online, which says, I did subscribe and asked many people to subscribe. I think this is by far the best YouTube channel that I love very much. I feel like I'm in school again, but learning with joy. Oh, now who did that come from? Uh, it came from a gentle, or somebody by the name of Motor, but I have no idea what Motor. that is. Oh. Well, motor, I mean, uh, that's just great. You've got our engine running by saying <laughs> all those nice words. Uh, thank you. Thank you for those nice words. We really appreciate it. And, uh, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to continue this so that uh, that channel will expand and there will be a real record of... Uh, what it takes to create the, this beautiful artwork. I mean, so few people in this country walk through the door and, and you know, we get questions like you wouldn't believe, like things like, well, what's all this, pot, what's all this stuff made out of anyway? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it does say Andrea Fisher find pottery on every door and every window. Or people will say to me, are you Andrea Fisher? Did you make mm -hmm. all of these? And I always tell them yes. I figure that if they're going to ask, if they're going to ask if I made four thousand pieces of pottery here in the gallery, <laughs> that they deserve the answer that I give them. But uh, uh, you know, they they know so little about the history of the Southwest. They think it all started when the Pilgrims landed, and or when Columbus showed up. And it's sort of like, well. What about those millions of people that were already here? <laughs> I mean, why, why do you think the history of this country started then when, you know, someone from Europe put their foot on uh, the soil here? And, you know, the schools, they, they do have fifth grade, um, but that I've heard from teachers, they have a fifth grade unit on Native Americans, but with, what, 500 different recognized tribes in this country, you know, a, a one week unit on uh, Native America is uh, not quite enough uh, to even begin to scratch the surface of what happens. And, you know, the Southwest is really, really special because um, in, lots of ways the rest of the country, the native people have been sort of absorbed into the, the uh, local culture. But here, uh, they're really distinct and, and, uh, and, and have managed to keep a lot of their uh, traditions and their rituals alive. And it's, you know, it's a, a real testimony to the fact that New Mexico has survived with three cultures in it, and uh, um, that you know we still respect and celebrate our three very different cultures here in New Mexico. Yay! And that's what you know gives us the the possibility to have. Um, demonstrations and conversations like this. 
One more, huh? One more. One more. Such a nice color. Well, the time is just rolling by. Uh, we may have to to stop here so that you can get back before um, it's too late. It's it, kind of up to you. Yeah, it's kind of up to you. What do you guys want to do? It's it's uh, three thirty. Three thirty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't. I don't want you to have to, you know, be the ones to be used as an example of what it's like, you know, coming home late. Uh, <laughs> it's like our parents waiting for us. <laughs> oh yeah, all those, yeah, they're all, yeah, all the uh, uh, the tribal police, you know, standing there with the lights flashing and, and all of them armed and dangerous because you're coming home late. Yeah. We, we would not Standing leave. there with their hand on their hips. Yips, yeah. <laughs> you might have to drive back here so we can put you up for the night. <laughs> and then go back tomorrow and pretend like you've never been anywhere. Uh, <laughs> So what, what do you want to do? Do you want to uh, continue? How about on? another 30 minutes? Okay, okay yes. another 30 minutes, and then that way at least we'll see you start to paint. Do we have a fan downstairs? Yes, but I do not think we should turn it on. Oh. It is very powerful. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you mean we it? might blow away. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I can just see Carlos blowing down the door <laughs> with pot in hand. Yeah, you mean. <laughs> It might tip me over. <laughs> yeah. uh, is there anything else that we could do? Uh, hmm? Well, I guess we could... Uh, yeah, so we could talk about some of your pots. How about if we bring one over and then you can just sit where you are and watch the paint dry so to speak and uh, how about the material that, that I have over oh, here oh good well let's yeah that's even better go for it show us what you have okay this this right here this is the white slip that I use in applying uh, for the white it's all clean, there's no roots, there's no rocks in it. I screened it. So that goes, th this is for the white slip. And this here is the paint. This is what uh, the sheep herders use for their uh, mask, you know, not to get the sunburn. But it, actually, it's uh, a paint that we use for our uh, pottery. Well, can we back up a little? What do you mean the sheep herders use for a mask? Uh, they, use, they go out, you know, sheep herding, and uh, uh -huh. if there's no clouds, it's hot. And they grind these up, and put it on their uh, oh, so, faces. So that's, you know, just to, for protection. So that's get, hard sunscreen. Yes, uh -huh. natural, natural, uh, sunscreen natural sunscreen rather than the stuff you buy in the tube. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, hematite. hematite. It's hematite. Yeah. And so you grind the hematite and the hematite. Well, hematite Access is shiny. Sunscreen. And, yeah. and so what does it reflect the, the sun? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. Uh, it'll protect your skin. Uh huh. Uh, and it's almost like a brownish color. Uh huh. Oh, it's it's a nice color, isn't it? It's 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 a, a soft rug. It's almost like um, pipe stone. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's okay. It's soft. Uh huh. So do they soak it in water, like you soak the clay in no, water? No, you have to kind of like grind it. Grind it. Grind it. And then mix it with water. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this here is my mixing bowl. This is the same rock, uh, uh -huh. hematite. Uh, I found this when I was uh, uh, doing my hiking, 
It's a, it's a, a grinding ma stone. A matate. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Used for grinding corn. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. It, well, so, it was. So I mix my uh, paint in here. And so, how do you mix the paint? Do you use it like a grinding stone? This is a, a, a yucca fruit juice. Uh, the bananas from um, a yucca, the fruit that comes out. Uh huh. Uh, I go out and harvest that uh, when it's ripe. I take it home. Same thing with the spinach. I boil it, boil it down to a tar state. This right here, this right here is uh, these two are spinach, and these are wild bee weed spinach uh -huh. uh, yeah, well, resin. What the what I'm familiar with the the, the spinach, the bee weed, um, that you harvest it, then you cook it down. And you know you cook it in a pot over a fire until yeah. um, it's pretty thick. Yeah, tar-like. Yeah, and then you let it dry mm -hmm. in it you, into these little rocks, yeah. and then uh, you grind it on the stone and put water with it. And because spinach has lots of iron in it, mm -hmm. which is iron oxide, it will fire out black. But yes. the other one I'm not familiar with, the yucca. Because the yucca, yucca yeah, it's, it's doesn't the... grow in this altitude. I mean, we don't have a lot of yucca plants like uh -huh, you do uh -huh. where you live. Yeah, it, it's the same process of uh, making the uh, the tar. And does but, does it know, turn just, black too? Uh, it's, no, not really. It, it just soaks into the clay. Uh -huh. It soaks into the clay to make it, you know, more permanent. Uh, I'm sorry. It's like uh, uh, a paint, you know, that soaks into whatever you put on. It's like yeah. a primer. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. So the yucca juice is a primer. And you, you combine that with your paint? Yes, uh, with the hematite. Uh-huh. That, that gives the black color. And so when, when this pot is dry, you will have enough, uh, you will grind enough paint there that you'll paint that on the pot that we're looking at? Yeah, I usually make, you know, a lot and put it in a jar. Uh -huh. So that way you don't, I don't have to um, mix more uh -huh. uh, of the paint that I'm going to be using. So I usually kind of like mix the paint, put it in a jar, pour some more and mix it again and, and make more of it. And then from there, if I have enough of the paint, I'll start doing the painting. Uh-huh. And... So that's what's going to produce the black color. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And it's interesting because uh, hematite occurs naturally here. And like the pottery of Santa Clara and San Ildefonso, um, it's because of that hematite that's in the clay body. That's why when they do a reduction firing that the pots turn black instead of, you know, when you have stoneware and they do a reduction firing, the clay that's used for stoneware doesn't have that same hematite in it and they turn a dark, dark, dark brown. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the hematite is what uh, makes the black pottery at San Ildefonso and San Clara as black mm -hmm. as it is. Yeah. So now you're polishing it? Yes, I'm with, polishing. With just a soft cloth? Or, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh, or with a sock? With a sock, yeah. <laughs> with a sock. Good tools. I love people's tools. I mean, we've seen old pizza pans. <laughs> you just have to improvise on what. Oh yeah, everybody. What you everybody use. does that. And the Lewis girls, they all use um, uh, the the lids from school chewing tobacco mm -hmm. uh, for their scrapers, and they swear by them. And Ruby Panana from Zia uses a broken. I have my cup. scraper. Yeah. This is a gourd. It's a gourd. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I stepped on it. I ruined it. I glued it back together. <laughs> <laughs>
but it still works. It still works. Uh, good old Gorilla Glue, huh? Yes. Gorilla Glue. That really guys, works. Yeah, it helps really out. Works. Well, look at how nice and shiny that is now. Are you pressing really hard? Yeah, yeah. Trying to get get the grid off. Have Have you pressed too hard and have the? Because the pellet's in a very fragile stage now. I no, I, I I I know my uh, pots. Know, that it's you, it's gonna hold. Oh, <laughs> and you know your own uh, strength. Yes. Too, so mm -hmm. that's a good combination. Okay, I think it's good enough. And that is rainwater? Faucet water. I, I didn't bring water. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta improvise. Uh. <laughs> Does that mean the pot's gonna turn green? No, no. no. Oh, oh, good, good. It's, it's gonna burn off. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> no, it's just that uh, on a finished pot, like, you know, uh, you're gonna put water in it. Uh, when you put faucet water, uh, it's going to sip out. Uh -huh. And then it's going to show that when, once it dries, it's going to show that it, it, it was faucet water. Uh -huh. uh, you know, the chemicals that's in the water is yeah. just going to sip out too. So uh -huh. once it dries, it's going to turn green. But if it turns green, you just do another second firing. You know, that, that sounds familiar because I've seen older pots where I think people use them as flower vases. And there is, uh, there's a watermark on, the, you know, like an inch off the bottom of the pot. And it has a greenish color to it. And probably it was uh, faucet water that they used to put in their pot and make it into a flower pot. Oh, look at that clean line and that steady hand. And it sort of dries real quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, it soaks in right quick. Oh my goodness. And the line is so even and so uniform. I dread the, the idea of thinking that, uh, oh my goodness, and now a parallel line. I don't think I could do that in a million years, ever. <laughs> I'm reluctant to ask you questions, Carlos, because I don't want you to mess up.
watching Carlos paint. I mean, it's a real testament to the skill and practice that it takes uh, to be able to uh, paint those lines so perfectly and so consistently because that paint that he has isn't homogenized. It's not like the paint you buy in a store and you can just dip into the can and keep painting away. It's continually falling out of solution. And uh, just like the clay sinks to the bottom of the, um, the container in which he is uh, um, letting it dissolve so that he can uh, use it for uh, making the pots, the paint's doing the same thing with the water rising to the top. Uh, it's not as evident as it would be in a five-gallon bucket, but um, the paint uh, is a different th thickness as he puts it on and how he can keep those um, that thickness uni that thickness of the the paint uniform and then apply it round and round and round so it's exactly the same distance from the rim over and over again is just truly remarkable and is that the way you always begin, Carlos, with the lines around the top and bottom? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So that way I can fit in the designs that I'm going to put on it. Uh huh. Now, did your grandma do the same thing? Yes. She did. Uh, she did the same process of painting designs on it. Now, all of your pots have those same lines around the top? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting because, you know, what really stands out are the deer and the deer's houses and the trees and, and the lines of the snow and those big medallions and the heart lines. And you don't even think about the, the lines that are on top and bottom, and yet it takes so much skill to be able to do that. And everything is freehand. Those sort of scallops that you're making now, um, is it going to come out even at the end? Yes. <laughs> is that something you just know? Because uh, every pot is slightly different. Yeah, yeah. it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, it's got a different character to it, every pot. Yeah. I know that uh, some people who paint feathers around the rim, I've often asked them, what happens when you get to 
the end and you have a space left and the space will be either one really fat feather or two really skinny feathers and all the rest of them are just almost exactly the same size. What do you do? And uh, I've got, Almost. Yeah, almost. <laughs> oh, good for you, good for you. Once I do the design, after it's done, I'll go run another um, line to it to make it more of a uniform uh -huh. line. Well, you know, we're getting really close to the your last half an hour. So you're not going to have to drive it 90 miles an hour instead of 85, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope not. Uh, if we can, you know, be like the teacher and write you a note, uh, please excuse Carlos. <laughs> we don't want to have to bail him out of jail. <laughs> So what are you painting now? A rainbird design. The rain. Oh, you're painting, actually painting the rainbird. Yeah. Well, you know, if anybody has any questions, now would be a really good time, or comments, now would be a really good time uh, to ask them because uh, we're going to be closing down here. I mean, we could go on forever and ever, but there are time limitations for uh, Carlos so that he gets back to um, Zuni uh, before the curfew. And it's, you know, to protect everyone, but, you know, maybe on one of the next... Um, segments that, that we do, uh, we would, could invite you back, Carlos, and you could spend the entire time painting. Uh, and uh, that way we could all um, enjoy watching that. And, uh, and, you know, it would be really fun because this is very, very special to see you just have such an idea in your head and a the control of that brush uh, and that paint that is doesn't cooperate. I mean, it's really, really amazing. While Carlos is finishing up um, here, I just want to remind everyone that tomorrow we're going to have uh, Marilyn Ray from um, from Acoma Pueblo. She is a storyteller maker, and she is going to make storytell a a storyteller for us, which should be really kind of fun, and hopefully do some painting as well. And uh, we're looking forward to that, and it'll be between 11 and 3 o'clock tomorrow. Did I get that right? Yeah, 11 to 3. And, uh, oh, geez, I mean, I just hate to stop now, but... Uh, because it's so fascinating to watch that, uh, that that sort of lump of dirt that he started out with is now becoming this thing of beauty. And uh, it's uh, really fascinating to watch. 
Well, do we sign off? Carlos, it's up to you. Okay. Well, it, it's going to be a rainbird. Once oh. it's done, it's going to be three designs on it. Yeah. So I guess this is the end. <laughs> this is the end. But you know what? If you bring it back to us, we'll make sure that we put this finished piece up on our website so anyone who is tuned in to watching, they will have the oppor opportunity to see what the finished product looks like. Okay. But, you know, thank you so much. Thank you for all of your time and effort. Thank you for all your experience. Thank you for all your information. Um, thank you for huh, coming and doing this and being a wonderful supplier of us for, you know, for the gallery well, here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah to do the demonstration. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, it was really great to have you here. And, and like I said, yeah, this could go on for another five hours uh, because it would be fun to watch. But, you know, we respect the fact that, um, that you may be in deep trouble if you show <laughs> up late. You never know. And, and we want you to be safe and the whole uh, Pueblo of Zuni to be safe. Well, thank, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you again for everything you do and, and who you are. Mm -hmm. You want to say a few words, Derek? Well, thank you so much, Carlos. It was a real pleasure being here, and thank you so much. <laughs>